Welcome, dear viewers, brothers and sisters, to this ad hoc session we have today uh, related to a certain media, pers um, certain personality who has become quite prominent on the internet, uh, a very articulate individual, um, and no doubt some very useful content and some very motivational content. The brother's name is Shahid Bolson. Um, inshallah, we'll uh, invite him to respond, or and you know, he's entirely open to um, discuss with us directly. Um, so a bit of background about Brother Shahid. He's been a Muslim for many, many years. He's been quite active um, um, in Muslim issues. He's not necessarily, he doesn't class himself as an Islamist. He's very much concerned with the affairs of the Ummah, and he makes analysis based off of what he sees as flaws within uh, the Muslims' uh, approach towards revival or just basically how, they, how they're behaving. And he very much advocates uh, Muslims kind of practically sorting their problems out. And um, I'll, in fact, I'll let his words uh, speak for themselves. The reason we felt that it's quite important to intervene is because obviously any kind of overture towards changing the Muslims is as Muslims, we have a reference point. So you may have an analysis, you may have a flawed analysis, but ultimately as believers, we have to bring things back to our creed. And there are certain statements which you know, once I've played, you'll probably see where I'm coming from, that they are quite problematic, or at least maybe could have been worded better. And we'll give the brother the benefit of the doubt, inshallah. Um, there's been some context behind the initial video, which I'll be playing uh, shortly, uh, which I've uh, internally referred to as obey the rulers because that's effectively um, one of the main points was actually a rebuttal to a very um, um, articulate brother as well with his in Canada where he did a very good video around the issue of obedience to the rulers and he made a parallel how the rulers are not valid and it's almost he gave you the analogy within this particular video of imagine someone building um, an, an, axe, an axe to your house without permission you know just completely um running rapture over your own property that's the same uh, kind of parallel to the rulers that they have no valid contract anyway we, i will be uh, shortly playing everything in its entirety so that you can get the full context and the chef will be commenting and so we have our resident scholar and the importance of any matters to do with creed, any matters to do with uh, revival we have to refer back to the quran and sunnah and we are learning as we go and you know Information comes out, evidence has come out through scrutiny, through analysis, and it's a learning process. So we have somebody on hand uh, who's, who we've been studying for, under for some time. And the professor, Mohammed al-Masri, who is a, I consider to be a, a scholar um, on a number of uh, areas I, I have referred to, whether it's a fit or soul, and he's uh, published many, many books on the subjects of uh, usul, everything from uh, matters related to creed, matters related to sharia, matters related to revival, um, intricate issues around um, what happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Anyway, we can elaborate on that uh, in due course. Without further ado, I will play the first clip and invite the professor, inshallah, to comment. I will also spotlight on the video uh, for the sheikh because he's more photogenic than me. Okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. When I first came across this video, I considered responding to it at that time, but frankly, I hesitated because the topic is just so annoying, to be honest, because it just feels like one of those issues that every generation of Muslims has to just go through over and over again, as if the matter has never been clarified, as if there's been no educational progress. But then precisely because this is that kind of issue that every generation seems to have to pass through on their way to maturity and knowledge, I thought it might be potentially useful to address it. So I'm just going to play the clip and pause throughout to respond. Are we required to obey the rulers today as Muslims, considering that the rulers are tyrants, they torture people, kill people, they steal everyone's wealth, they collude with foreign nations against their own people. Most importantly, they rule with other than what Allah has revealed. Okay, stop. Right off the bat, He's throwing out generalities and accusations as if they are indisputable facts. So this is what you need to do if you're interested in having a serious discussion. Which rulers are we talking about? Which rulers are tyrants? Which rulers are killing and torturing people and stealing everyone's wealth? Which rulers are colluding with foreign nations against their own people? And which are ruling by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed? And each one of these allegations has to be substantiated. And I mean substantiated in terms of both 
proving that the torture and killing and theft and collusion are factually taking place, but also in terms of proving that none of this is justified on the basis of national security or providing for the general welfare of the society. Now, with regards to ruling by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, that is a complex discussion. I mean, you have to prove that they are ruling by what is contrary to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and or that the sharia does not form the fundamental basis for the laws and policy making of the government. Because the mere existence of unrevealed law, non-wahi based, non-sharia laws and regulations in their legislation does not constitute ruling by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. It constitutes ruling by what Allah revealed as well as by rules and regulations and laws that are dictated by situational necessity that are not stipulated by the sharia that are not stipulated by quran and sunnah matters that are mubah which is something they are allowed to do and it is something that every muslim ruler has always done throughout all of islamic history furthermore you have to prove that the extent to which they are ruling by other than what allah revealed constitutes kufr bawah open kufr or that certain uh, aspects of the sharia are not just being compromised for reasons of again national security or the general welfare of the population of the people. There may exist some sort of imperative or necessity that requires compromise. And are those aspects that can be compromised? This is a very complex discussion. And frankly, you can't actually talk about whether or not a country is ruling by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, unless you're a faqih, because it's not as simple a matter as you might think it is. I think uh, that's a convenient juncture to stop. Um, yeah. You yeah. think if you have enough for that, I mean, there will be additional discussion on there. Yeah. Uh, he, he continues about rebellion and things like that. Uh, based off of what you've heard there, what are your initial thoughts? I and mean, if you can comment for us. Uh, he says, uh, I don't know what his, uh, does, is he declare himself or he's perceived as from a Salafi background or from Hanafi background? It's not entirely clear because he's he is quite a what, stern what, against Juan what, what, What's about his ethnicity? I saw once a video. He's American. He's American by. He's born in. He's uh, from Boulder. He's a revert, re convert convert to Islam. So, so he's uh, is not uh, ethnically like from Pakistan or India. No, no. He he's immigrated. Like he, he's a Asian or something. No, no. He's American. Uh, no, just, just to understand background, so, so to understand because the background will, will throw light in some of your understanding and make some excuses. So it's very. So he's a, a new convert to Islam. So he seems to be he's widely read, and but it seems to be uh, he's. It seemed to be more sophisticated, much more sophisticated than General Salafi. Let's see, uh, and um, uh, you would say more of, uh, uh, not like, oh yes, Hamza Yusuf, Yusuf or, uh, or Hamza Yusuf, uh, who is like, like um, with a Sufi classical fiqh background. That, uh, he seems to be much more sophisticated and advanced. Uh, also, also one, one thing, about, one point to make about Hamza Yusuf as well, mm -hmm. there is a massive nefarious uh, trait behind there. If you just need to look at his his the person he refers to Abdullah bin Bayer. If you look yeah. at the Rand report, he fits exactly that kind of profile. There's a lot more. In fact, there will there will be videos yeah. produced about this. Uh, uh, he started on report. the hand of of a Soviet inclined government scholar essentially. More yeah. this, and like there, for example, one of their guys, Habib Ali Jafri, hand in glove with people like uh, Kadyrov, uh, okay. of you know, yeah. the one who, you know, in in Chechnya. Complete every kind of tyrant he's behind. So whereas you've got those yeah. who are bootlicking okay. America, no, just, like, just a background, just so we can find excuses or find understanding where someone comes. That's all affects the self, all the theoretical, but that's only theoretical. A human being should be able to withdraw completely from this background and become uh, as neutral as humanly possible. But this is a very tall order and extremely difficult. Uh, maybe only achievable by infallible prophets. Every human being will have some stains from his. Uh, uh, let me give a, uh, an example for that. A man of the rank of Abu Dhar al Ghifari, who is a very high ranking Sahabi, and the man of uh, almost certainly we can say he's the one of paradise because he embraced Islam very early. And uh, he's about the uh, coming of a prophet in Mecca, uh, Muhammad, and he went there and uh, 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 professed Islam publicly, and the Me Meccan beat him almost to death. And the Messenger Allah said to him, uh, told him, go back to your tribe. He's from Ghifar. And Ghifar are regarded by the Makis as a despicable tribe who intercept the Hajji and the, robber, uh, the highway robber and things like that. You will not find any protection in Mecca on any love. 
and they cannot protect you, obviously. And wait until you hear that I am ha have uh, uh, have succeeded, then you join me. And he joined in Medina, obviously, you know. So he's one of the Sabiqin Al-Awwiyan Muhajirin al Ansar, without any doubt. Although he missed Badr, but he's definitely a Sabiqin Al-Awwiyan Muhajirin, and his exoneration and praise in, uh, uh, through the wedding of the Prophet is not one or two or three, many ahadi. So it's no doubt that he is definitely one of the people of the paradise, without any doubt. Still, the, this very man uh, still could not get all the stain of Jahiliya from himself. One day he got uh, excited and angry. Obviously, he was an impulsive character, that's clear from the story, and to, uh, said to Bilal, Bilal, Bilal being an Abyssinian, being a black, the son of the black. And uh, Bilal complained to him, say, Allah, but that's the Messiah Allah addressed him, did you, did you, uh, did you, uh, Regard as negative that his, his mother is black, you still have stains of Jahiliya. So Abu Dhar to con control that stain and disable himself, insisted to lay on the ground, put his foot, head on the on 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 the on the ground, which is for the Arabs a major uh, major. They cannot accept that and ask Bilal to put his foot on his head. Say, so put your foot on the son of the Arabs, so he can learn, learn discipline and humble himself. So he was managing himself. He could learn. And one day he saw that the Messiah of Allah is a, another occasion. Uh, he saw the Messiah of Allah appointing many people, etc., in in uh, in various positions. Say, Messiah of Allah, you did not appoint me anything else. Say, Abadar, and Tarajun Daif. You are a weak man. You don't have the strength. And this appointing people in, in position of trust requires certain strength which you don't have. Messiah of Allah is honest and open. You will not avoid someone who doesn't have the strength of leadership. This may help us, this hadith later, what is the strength of leadership? It's not a strength in praying and so on, and purity and being early in Islam. That's not enough. There are other characteristics of character. You may be early in Islam, possibly higher in paradise or rank, but not necessarily suitable. And uh, taking taking such a public position is, is, a, is a very heavy burden. So don't ever accept to manage the money of an orphan nor to accept to be a leader of uh, two persons or more. So obviously two persons or more because you don't have the qualification to lead people. Impulsive character, no patience. But what's managing the money of orphan? Is it a, a, a man who will steal the money? No, but he will be spending the money on charity. That's not the way you manage the money on orphan. You will manage it the frugal money way, holding with iron fist everything except the most obligatory charity. <laughs> That's what a manager of the, an orphan money should, should be. So he never accepted any one of these positions after that, for the instruction of the Messenger of Allah. So as you see, so such a man, so when we say uh, the people may have still stains of their background and so on, that is, that is natural, there's nothing negative there. So the brother is obviously uh, has studied Islam, had, had accumulated considerable amount of, of knowledge, but he is, is falling, let me, the most fundamental fallacy is falling in, and it is a, uh, when it talks about uh, ruling with what Allah has done, we'll come to if the rulers are like that or not. The current ruler. That's the studying the reality and analyzing it. But let's say what's the fundamental philosophical reference. Uh, the, one statement he said, they may be, uh, they, it doesn't necessarily that uh, that what they were, uh, the ruling they have is contradicting Islam. Uh, this means that there may, there may be a ruling which does not contradict Islam, but is not right from Islam. This, uh, this have the 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 nasty uh, uh, supposition in the background uh, of many people. The majority of Muslims are like that, by the way, is to think that the Sharia is somehow not complete, and uh, you need to fill it with, by by adopting some uh, something from another laws, adopting something from Qiyas. Qiyas is actually making another law, adopting something from Istihsan, etc. The problem with that is that wh where this disease has come. And it infected all madahab essentially after Sahaba time essentially. And some Sahaba even has fallen to that because the majority of Sahaba were not fuqaha anyway. The, the hallmark of the Sahaba, which made them the distinguished generation, is that they were sincere and they're willing to struggle for, for due to their sincerity. They're willing to die for it. That's what makes them, that's when they are sadiqeen, they are honest, they are truthful. No, they are great scholars. No, that's not true. That's not true. Definitely not true. There were scholars after them. Who are superior to them in scholarship, in, in, in matter of uh, technical term of scholarship, but not in matter of willingness to die for that what you believe and confront tyrants and confront kafir and, and munafir in the proper way, according to uh, what, what Sharia made, had made as an injunction. So the reality is that the Sharia is complete. 
So how come we have many things which we doesn't seem to, we don't have, for example, we don't have, for example, uh, any hadith or any ayah of Quran which, uh, which address the issue of that. Can I fix my nose? Doesn't need because we have the fundamental, important, usuli point, qaida. It's a qaida. It is a rule. It is, it is not a derivation rule. It is a, a rule. It's general, a general ruling of everything. Be, 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 a general ruling of permissibility. Everything. Every entity in the universe, both entities, attributes, actions, even thoughts and ideas, is permissible. You can have have any thought. You can have any idea. You can you can you can do whatever you want, until the Sharia made an injection that this what this act, this specific act, is obligatory or desirable. It doesn't need to bring any injection that is permissible. It's permissible by default. Let's say use the language of default. Permissible by default or an injunction that's undesirable or haram, or an injunction that it has said is called uh, ruling of, of interrelation, what they call hukum wadai. It is a cause for something, it's a condition for something, it is uh, it's a, it's a barring condition, uh, it is uh, uh, yeah, it's a condition, it's a necessary condition or a barring condition, etc. So that's, uh, if you take that ruling, it's very clear that all human activities, especially the activities of the world, are essentially but fundamentally permissible. Human activity, to start with. So that covers everything. That, 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 that has not been seen by the people in time past, clearly in that. They have seen it in, indirectly in a, in a, in a, in a somehow, uh, 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 let's say, um, uh, nebulous way. Especially if it relates to items, like say the benefits or the things of the universe, like Hizb say, the benefits, the items of the universe, are the basic ruling that is permissible. What's the meaning of the item of the universe? What, what uh, the sun is, is a permissible. What's mean the sun? I mean, meaning the sun as an item, whatever I can do to the sun or benefit from the sun, I'm permitted to do it. Look at the sun, do this, do that, etc. Uh, if you say, for example, sheep is halal. Meaning I can slaughter it, I can burn it, I can torture it, I do everything, basically. Until Sharia says, yeah, you can you can kill it, it has been killed in a certain way. You cannot torture it, you can do this, you cannot do this, you can do this, this haram, this kabira, this is this, this etc. So based on that, it comes clear that Sharia is complete. But it, it, uh, you, you need, after being uh, over centuries, uh, Muslim world, since the, the deviation started with Muawiyah, which we will address later. It became it's a people in, in, inclined and inclined in their mind to ask, for example, I've been, been I have been called for many uh, since I arrived in Britain and became a little bit known. Many people call me say, "What uh, what is the evidence that that, that uh, this is mubah? We can do." I say, "Brother or sister, if you want to say sisters, I say, your question is wrong. Ask me what is the evidence that is prohibited to do so and so or desirable to do so and so." Asking about permissibility is wrong because the basic ruling of everything, every action is permissibility. So based on that, he had this misconception. Therefore, any law or regulation, we have to look at it. It may, it may go to regulation of the permissible, um, the mubah, or it may have some issues which are related to the declaring something to be usually uh, states in uh, enacted laws and regulations and so on. Do not at least desirable and desirable. Let's say you must do that, or you are not allowed to do that, or, you are, or sometimes expressing clearly you are permitted to do that. By the way, uh, European system tend also to mention what you are permitted to do. In the common law system of Britain and America, especially Britain, there is no need to to uh, uh, to to, uh, to do any permission, they have essentially a general law of permissibility. Uh, that's to say, if something is not prohibited or obligatory by a statute or by law, law meaning here uh, uh, well established uh, court ruling, which is a precedence, well established until it's obviously overwritten or sent by, by another or a ruling or or a statute, uh, then everything is permissible. So in Britain, is that the principle really, which is subconsciously in, in the law system, is that everything you can't do anything, you don't need. Uh, for uh, for example, to uh, to uh, to check that at that point, for example, uh, we had the, the moment, for example, drones were invented, uh, nobody bothered. Everyone was flying drones until a statue came, say, regulating that you could not, couldn't could not fly near airports or to these highest 
or interfering with aeroplanes, etc. Which is common sense. The people obviously did not do that, and some mischievous were doing so. They needed a statute to make them punishable. Otherwise, they could not punish them because the judges say there's no law prohibiting that or a previous ruling. You cannot punish them now. You should have done that before and acted the law, something like that. So the, the common law system of Britain is having this, this characteristic without being accepted explicitly. The Islamic law is definitely based on that, by necessity of reason and perception and by the eyes of Quran, which I discussed in the book of Tawheed and they refer to it again. This is the fundamental qaida of Islamic law. So it, uh, so whatever uh, law, so whatever law the uh, regulation is either done with what has happened, is this law either derived from Islam or not derived from Islam, the derived from revelation? How the details of derivation has to be shown to the people who who, 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 who are discussing discussing with the ruler is that according to Islam, it cannot be that he says, for example, I, I gave you the following example, when uh, when uh, people discuss, for example, is an underage person, like I say, one under seven years to be to exclude the cases of a can he distinguish between good, good and bad in a limited way, so he's a partial responsibility. But they say someone is not mumayyiz, not in distinguishing case, less than seven. Is he is, is he criminally responsible? In Islam, we know the hadith of Sayyidina Allah, we refer to the hadith of Sayyidina Allah, Rafi al Qalam Athalas. The pen has been lifted, there's no sense we've written on the 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 uh, the young or uh, sorry, the, the uh, underage until he achieves maturity uh, from the mentally uh, mentally impaired until he gains uh, mental capacity, capacity and uh, the one who is asleep. So if you uh, if you commit a crime while you're asleep, you're sleepwalking, then you are not responsible until he wakes up. And what what happened in your sleep, for example, you you swear or something like that, you are not in full capacity of. Uh, and also there are other steps, situations which you like for some state of extreme anger, which is called Iglaq, then your action are having no validity. If you divorce or you free slaves or you do any action, then it is you are because essentially what they call in modern law, temporary insanity. If it argue this way, and this part of the law, that one under seven years it cannot be tried or cannot uh, held uh, legally responsible in a criminal case, then we are applying Islam. But if you apply the same rule that one of the seven years, because the French law says that, or the Belgium law, this is kufr, because we refer outside Islam. So what the British I did not understand is that you have to have the reference where you get that injunction, where you get that law. That's what makes it Islamic or non-Islamic. If you recognize that fundamental point, then you start seeing clearly where you are going. That's the point. Now, someone say, but many things are regulation of Rubah. Ways, means, and procedures, like for traffic signals and so on. They're just regulating mobile. I could control, I could make traffic, traffic regulation by uh, re uh, regulating that, for example, uh, at red light, people move, at green light, people stop. Or another, other colors besides red and green. This is very conventional. But it's uh, regulating the mobile because at an intersection, you could not see who is crossing. And obviously, if we don't do such a regulation, it's mobile to go at any time, at any crossing. But obviously, this will definitely in, 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 in a society, not in every single case, this will lead to accidents and possibly people injured and killed. And the Sharia has clear injunction, uh, uh, clearly making clear that this must be, must be prevented by any means. Any means, ways and means I can develop. Now I can adopt them. They said the, all the world is adopting that uh, green is, uh, is to move and uh, red to stop. Why should they have another adoption? No, it does not make sense. Especially since equipment and so on are built this way. It would be stupid to take something else. There's no problem to say, let I take the, the, or for example, driving right or driving left. I would rather adopt what, adopt what the whole world has adopted. But other countries say, oh, we adopt the left driving because that's what the British did in time past and it's well established. And changing it's a bit difficult. Either this or this, because both are permissible. Driving the right hand side or left side, both are permissible. And we have to adopt one of them so that the traffic can organize and we don't have uh, every uh, few seconds an accident. So, ways, means, and procedure we can adopt from others. Because we know before adoption that they are belonging to the domain of permissibility. And we can perpetrate whatever you want, take from anyone we like, learn from anybody we wish. You see the point? So based on that, the question to those rulers and what the rules they have is that 
currently, especially after sex peak and after the First World War, where the whole Muslim world is essentially fell under occupation. There was an exception, maybe formally, publicly. Saudi Arabia, current Saudi Arabia, it was not Saudi Arabia at that time, it was actually Najd. The, the Hijaz was not belong to that. And, and Hijaz was still independent in some sense, but the Khilaf Osmania collapsed and then these entities emerged. Some of them were semi natural, and uh, Afghanistan was not occupied as far as you know, and the rest were essentially uh, created by Sykes Pico and by, by, by the imperial powers of the Second World War. And uh, then uh, they started to rule. Uh, some of them even adopted foreign laws before that, and some of them uh, uh, adopted even completed uh, law with the, for example, Khilaf of Maria since 1850, around that, until its fall. It has fallen actually before that, uh, let's face it. But from 1850 onward, which is one of the mistakes, I, I argue that the Sheikh al Islam gave a fatwa that it's okay as long as that don't contradict Islam. So it seemed to be. And this brother Shahid is following this fatwa of the uh, Sheikh al Islam. But the fatwa of Sheikh al Islam is invalid. It contradicts the fundamental principle of Islam because they have adopted certain law, laws which are not derived from Islam and some of them contradict Islam. So is, the point, is the point that you're making that since that point until now, the default position has been that most of these states rule by kufr? And it's open kufr in a manner that is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we'll, we'll get up to that. So, so that's that because his premise is that I'm discussing the the legal and philosophical premises. Then we now discuss these entities as they exist, what they are. I'm just measuring that as an example. So, if we clarify that, then a ruler has to derive his ruling, a being is an abstract law or regulation or an individual case in this case, case of judicial ruling or even an executive case has to be ultimately based on Quran and Sunnah, in that sense, as I specified, including the choice of Mubahat and specifically saying, this is Mubahat, we have to choose the, the most suitable Mubahat. And there's also a rule of choosing Mubahat, it's not arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. Like, for example, you cannot say, oh, uh, it's okay to work at night and sleep at day, and, or sleep, uh, or, or especially in, 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 in hot summer and so on. And opposite. And then you enact a law like Al Hakim Bi Amrillah Al Fatimi in Egypt and acted prohibiting people uh, uh, trading and, and, and working at, at daytime. They should sleep there and work at night. This is tyranny. Because this will put the people under, under duress and force them to spend money for energy and so on for no good reason. All that uh, principle is Mubah. You could choose for yourself. You have a sleep pattern. You, should, you could choose for yourself. I work at night. My type of work or choose such jobs which are required at night, like like being a guard or something like that, and sleep at day. That's more but your choice. But in acting by state, by force, and punishing who is violating is is a is a cover bois because there is absolutely no justification to make that choice. And he never justified that. That's number one. Secondly, the rules have to justify. Secondly, he mentions that some of the rules who, who, who he admits implicitly that some of the rules contradict Islam. But it may be necessitated by, by, by previous conditions, by, by duress, by things like that. If that's true, let's assume it is true, then it should be known and explained like that. We know this law, we inherited from time the British law, and it is uh, going on in such a way that we cannot change it immediately, but we must change it, and we have to change it in the future. We know that it's not Islamic. But we cannot change it now because of necessity, because of certain conditions, something like that. And this has to be shown to the people. Because the people cannot be ruled, ruled by, with, not with something un Islamic, even at the duress, without explaining to them why. They have the right to know that. It seems your brother Shahid is living in another world, somewhere. although if he's originally American, when the society who is at, at least in the theory on paper, supposed to be free, the end of the free, that point for, 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 should have been clear for him. It should be have been clear. He should, he should, he should, he should have been, he should have been adopting this point, which is fundamentally Islamic. The people have the ruled one because the ruler is supposed to be applying Islam and managing the public affairs for the benefit of the people, chosen by the people, accounted by, accounted by the people. That's the Islamic system. Seems to be he thinks that tyranny from Muawiyah onward until now is the Islamic system. No, it's a deformed system, which strictly speaking is not Islamic. So this is the fundamental points. I think if there's a fundamental mistakes points which he started start, starting from. Can you give us an example of uh, duress? So for example, there's an individual- I have no example. He has to give examples. 
Okay. There's not. Oh, say, for, say for example, the state. The state, a state has been established. Um, and it was no, no, no. I'll give you an example. Yes, the British uh, invade invade a, a country like uh, like uh, invade a place like Hadramaut, who invaded the, those local rulers, and enforced the state local rules for them. Maybe some said to court, but the ruler stayed in power and applied this because he believed and to, to maybe told the people or maybe didn't tell the people at that time, is that I have to apply these rules, otherwise the British will come and apply even more West rule. For example. So to protect you, I'm complying with this. For example, at least I'm complying, accepting that they use the ports to attack other Muslim countries, which by itself is an act of kufr. But I have no power. I cannot confront them. That's an example. I mean, the rulers today, I mean, they're, they're much... But in that case, in that case, the ruler is a Muslim. Maybe a good Muslim. He's doing it with good motivation, good reason. But the system is a system of kufr. The domain is not the domain of Islam. It was under the control of the British anyway. Mm -hmm. In that time. That's one example. Another example, I don't understand what the meaning of the US. Well, you can, for example, IMF, RIBA, all this kind of stuff. No, uh, there's no the US there. That's no the US. This is clear. Look at the Saudi Arabia. Before if the 50s, before that, I'm not aware of anywhere that there was any usury banking. People trading essentially with basic Islamic interactions. Generally, simple, but low level, less, less complicated, but they were trading this way. And the ruler they introduced that deliberately because they were not a kafir. And they didn't bother. And they found all kinds of excuses and cover up and so on and uh, 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 stopping everyone from talking against it, including their own scholars, even until the last days of his life of Ibn Bas, he was issuing fatwa against that. And the fatwas were issued secretly and distributed as secret people through the country. Imagine the mufti of the country uh, cannot say that his fatwa publicly and distribute it. If they had any legal argument, any reason for that, they should have. They could have said there is some fatwa of Azhar saying it's actually not these commercial loan. Only only personal loans are are riba. They could have said that. Then we say okay, get a get a conference of Muslim scholars and discuss that publicly. But as a matter of fact, they cannot say that simply because the one of main income of the banks since that time, but especially later is uh, uh, loans to, to, to individual persons for consumption loans. And that's actually the banking system is living in the last 20, 30 years on the consumption loans. That's why the banks are still surviving. All other loans are bad, only the consumption loans. The 30%, 25 to 35% uh, uh, interest on your credit card is that what, what the banks are living from. That's if you check the banking statement every quarter, or every half year or every year, that's the, the, where, where the plus comes. All other things are negative, 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 negative. Commercial loans, etc., etc., etc. That's what will keep them alive. So even that argument, wouldn't, even the uh, Azhar statement, will not save. Professor, uh, even today's state, they are explicit about the fact that in their constitution, uh, that they adopted the laws of uh, like uh, uh, previous colonial um, uh, empires from yeah, French yeah. and from yeah. English. So, exactly. Exactly. Especially in commerce, I mean, I know from uh, from the Egyptian constitution, for example, that the commerce, uh, the law of commerce and the Egyptian constitution, I don't know about the, the one that's changed in 2012, but I know of, of the time of uh, the Husni Mubarak, you know, era, that it, 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 they adopted the, uh, the laws of the, of the British for the uh, commerce, co co commerce yeah. law and trade and stuff like for that. Example, another example is that most, most of the country, if they have a constitution which is probably formulated, is that, like, for example, uh, like most constitution or, or in the Muslim countries say, uh, Sharia al-Islamiya, Masdar al tashri'a Masdar al is the main source of tashri'a not the only source of tashri'a That's not permissible. It can't be. Only Masdar is. It has to be the only source of tashri'a. Well, not only, and even the, the formulation is bad, but let's, uh, let's be forgiving. It should not be Sharia Islam, it should be Quran, the revelation, the Quran and Sunnah. Or Allah is the ultimate sovereign. He is the ultimate reference. What is the technicality of that? Leave that to the detail so and the philosophers to discuss. But that must be stressed. The sovereign, the ultimate sovereign, the absolute sovereign is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not, uh, well, not the king. Uh, shall I continue? Because there's a lot more that we want to. Yes, so that's, now we go to the reality. So this is the fundamental. I think this is what this is where his problem starts. He does, I think, for good reason, because this was not 
is not what usually put on the table. Even Hizb al-Tahrir, the old Hizb al-Tahrir, the, 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 one, the, the one who he is a, whom he is rebutting is from Hizb al-Tahrir. Even Hizb al-Tahrir failed to see this point and give it its uh, to all sharpness. Especially he failed that when applying to Khilaf Uthmani in its last 70 years. Because the Hizb, for political reasons, and because that's with the obsession with the Khilafah, Khilafah, Khilafah call, declared that the Khilafah fell 1924. If they admitted that Khilafah fell already in time of Abdul Majid the Thani, Majid Abdul Majid the Second, around 850, 1850, then uh, the whole thesis would be collapsing, and then he would face the problem that even before 1850, there were other laws adopted from Kufr, and before that, the Abbasi had some, some things which smelled for Kufr, and even Bani Umayyah, and then even Muawiyah, then they will be stuck. Then they will say, if say Muawiyah ruled by Kufr, then meaning Muslims were, were not ruled by Islam through history. Muslim life were generally Islamic and general uh, issues of, of uh, private life or uh, individual commerce as well. But the state structure, even the state structure became non-Islamic. The ruling system was undermined. That's what the Prophet has prophesied, said the 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 the, the, aura, uh, the what's the translation of aura? Um, uh, when you, when the ties or the knots of Islam will oh, yeah. be unknotted, will be broken one after one, starting with ruling, meaning government and so on, governments, ending with salah. Starting with ruling, ending with salah. And the first knot which has be, been, been unknotted is Muawiyah. So he, he faced that, that they wanted they want to say, how can we, if we call the people to Khilafah Khilaf Rashid only, that's the only valid system, then all that history, meaning we did not have a valid system, and the people say you are referring to something which is ancient and not in the memory, and the Hizb thought we have to refer. No, Khilaf Uthmani was a Khilafah, was Islamic. It has some shortcomings, still Islamic. He tried to, so that the people feel motivated. It's nearby, it's not that far away. Yes, not far away, some application of Islam. Well, and many aspects of good and particular Islam were applied. Like, for example, no borders, all Muslims were welcome in the domain, all these things. They're nice aspects, many aspects like that. But the extremely negative aspect, like, like tyranny, like rulers killing each other, taking, uh, taking power by force, usurping the right of the ummah, these are extremely negative aspects. Well, some of them even border on Kufa, etc. So that's the dilemma of his as a political party. He thought, I cannot move the people except by appealing to we established the Khilafah. It was just yesterday, 1924, just 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's not a thousand years ago. No problem. He should have taken example of the caller of democracy in Europe who was referring to what? I'm not referring to the Middle Ages, nor to the, they're referring to the old uh, Athenian uh, and, and Greek democracy. And they, they didn't bother that in between it was a bad time. Yes, it was a bad time. We have to admit it. We have to clean that mess. What's the problem? Anyway. I'm not now obviously to criticize Hezbo because Islam, but that's the motivation. That's the and the sub subconscious motivation for Hezbo. So that, that's it. Now, when applied to the current ruler, he's correct. We have to verify it. But I think I, I don't think he would deny if I understand this fundamental point. He cannot deny. It. Let's look what he would say. Which ruler? I don't know which ruler he means now. Which ruler is he's including? Because what the, the Shab of Hezbo is addressing the existing ruler. Some he may could say, okay. Uh, killing the people doing that and that may not apply in such clear and sharp way to Taliban and maybe Iran because they declare Islam and it's not clear that they're doing that to that extent. At least Iran not in their domain. They're doing it in Syria as proxy. Uh, Taliban not doing it anywhere. But all other regimes are clearly doing that. Look, for example, Saudi Arabia, uh, imprisoning someone to uh, 35 years for, for one tweet. A tweet supporting the Palestinian. 35 years, a woman has got a 35 imprisonment. It's absolute tyranny. Maybe he's, he's sympathetic to Pakistan. But Pakistan has also created some, some uh, uh, laws that uh, contradict Pakistan, including usury banking, like in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, the third video, there will be ample ammunition. There's, it's really shocking, the third video, uh, where he starts talking about some pragmatic issues and it gives a level of husn as done, which, um, yeah, that will be interesting to discuss. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the uh, that is gullible political, so on any human being can be gullible because it is unfortunately through Islamic history scholarship after the time of Sahaba and great tabi'in who fought against the Hajjaj in Jamajim. After that, essentially, 
with your rebellion say they are like they the Ali and like the, the, the rebellion the revolution or the rebellion of Muhammad the Nafsa Zakiya uh, and the Abbas rebellion itself which became successful and turned into a tyranny etc except that uh, the the general tendency of scholarship is to submit and be obedient and avoid conflict to the law general only few dare to confront you very few very few you count them in one fingers that's it only few that's nobody else so that's it so he's following that tradition we cannot blame him because if you come such a tradition over so many generations it's very difficult to withdraw yourself from that because it's as as if you are skinning yourself by force and bleeding that's very painful so that's i think if you look at otherwise except these two regimes these two regimes uh, i'm not really even uh, completely islamic I could argue for example, yeah, because the Taliban or these mountain people, the Godfather, they kicked the American butt. Fine, great, no problem. But in matter of ruling and statecraft, they live uh, seven centuries back. They are they're living in the dark age. They are as as Sheikh Taki used to, to uh, describe most scholars of his time and most scholars of our time still as Dalami, dark age scholar or dark age student of. Of Sharia, they're living in the dark age. That's because the, concerning Taliban, concerning Iran, is Khomeini was could not do it otherwise except to, to get away from the from the myth of the one in in, in the tunnel or something like that, except by inventing another myth of the wilaya al faqih. Wilaya al faqih means the faqih has a wilaya. Who is the wilaya faqih in Quran and Sunnah? Contradicts necessity by non-Islam by necessity. No faqih has a wilaya. A faqih is a leader, intellectual leader, but he has no wilaya. He has no guardianship. According to Khomeini, essentially, the Tafaqi is a guardian on you, like your father guardian on you if you are underage. You cannot even open a bank account without permission. You can do anything without his guidance. No, that's not the case. Faqih has no such good eye. Faqih has intellectual leadership. If you ask him about fatwa and he give you a fatwa, he has no way to enforce it on you. Unless he is a judge, then he is enforced by the power of the state as a judge of the state. Not, not as a, because he is a faqih, because he is a judge. A judge is something else. A judge is to settle a dispute in a binding way. Otherwise, there's no wilaya. And the whole system is built on wilaya al-faqih. I mean, yeah, all the reason... Strictly I mean, it... speaking, wilaya al-faqih is a kufr system. Mm-hmm. For example, mm-hmm. unfortunately, painfully. I'm conscious. I'm, I'm conscious that there's a lot more to get through, inshallah. So, so, so I'll just give the general, general, general base, the general base to put the general base. So, it's a real problem, really, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 the current Muslim uh, rulers and their situation. Except maybe two who people could be provoked. Karim Sadiq, rahmatullah, the founder of the Muslim Parliament in Britain, well, he thought that uh, that uh, Iran is. Uh, hopefully the beginning of a new khilaf or something like that and was arguing although he's Sunni by the way Sunni Hanafi which showed very a high level of non-sectarian mi- mindset and devoted to Islam for him Rahmatullah Ali Karim Sadiq definitely that shows his high rank in Islam and his devotion to Islam but he was he was at this point was not clear in his mind yeah I knew him very well he was he lived on my road um, yeah. Yeah. he's actually uh, he broke off from another my uncle's group the Khilaf Rashida so he did have Certainly, the idea behind uh, yeah. the the concept of khilafa. Um, yeah. If it's okay with you, I'd like to play the next bit because this is where it gets onto the issue of rebellion and and rulers, um, and the idea of contract. So this is Mazin speaking. There's some out. Muslims out there they say that we are required to obey these rulers and not rebel against them, not even speak out against them in public, based on the hadith of the Prophet who orders us to obey the rulers, not rebel against them, and not speak out against them in public, and so on. Yes, there are many, many hadiths commanding obedience to the ruler, even if that ruler is a tyrant, even if they are killing and torturing people and stealing their wealth, even if they are colluding, even if they're doing all manner of things that you do not recognize as acceptable Islamically. And even if they're ruling by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, as long as that does not constitute open kuf. Now, when I was younger, these hadiths were very hard to swallow. And I totally understand why any young people today would also have a hard time with them. Though the disastrous rebellions in Egypt, in Syria, in Libya, and elsewhere should make it a little bit easier to understand the reasonableness and the wisdom of these hadiths. So how does this apply today. Okay. Well, the whole thing comes down to a pretty simple point, which is contracts. In order to understand this, look at a contract between, for example, a contractor, say he's going to build an extension or fix something. 
imagine that the, a contractor barges into your house and just starts building stuff. And after he finishes building, he says, you owe me a lot of money. You say, I don't owe you anything. He says, but the Prophet said, said, you have to pay the worker before his sweat dries. The thing is, there was no valid contract. So he doesn't have any of the rights afforded to a person who has a contract for such work. And the same thing for the ruler and the ruled. The position of the ruler is a position that is contracted. It's an agreement. And it's called the bay'at, which is a pledge of allegiance between the people and the ruler. That the ruler rules with Islam and the people obey him as long as he's ruling with Islam. So if you don't have a valid contract, you have none of the rights that Islam gives the ruler, and the people have none of the responsibilities that they have towards the ruler. And therefore, all these ahadith and all these ayat that talk about the ruler and so on, they only apply to a khalifa that is legitimate according to Islam, according to the conditions of a valid ruler-ruled contract. And therefore, people who say that we have to obey the rulers today, no, we don't. Okay, so now we get to the crux of his argument, which is that he has found the ultimate loophole for uh, justifying rebellion against the rulers. There's no contract. There's no bayah. There's no formalized consent of the government. Therefore, the rulers are all illegitimate, and they have no claim on the rights that are granted to them in the hadiths about obedience. Again, of course, this is not a new argument. It's an old one. And when I was first new in Islam, I would have thought it was just as brilliant as he seems to think it is. But it's not brilliant. So again, let's try to get specific. He is alleging that the Muslim rulers have no bayah, no formal consent of the people to govern. Okay, which rulers? There are about 190 Muslim majority countries in the world. So which countries are we talking about and which rulers? The Muslim majority countries that have the largest Muslim populations in the world are Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Egypt, and Turkey. Those are all officially democracies and mostly functional democracies with the exception of Egypt and currently Pakistan, but we'll get back to that later. So in these countries with the largest Muslim populations in the world, they literally elect their rulers by democratic process. And in fact, most Muslim countries, despite what you may think, most Muslim countries have some form of parliamentary democracy whereby the, the, the people elect the parliament and then the parliament elects or appoints the ruler. Either the head of the party becomes the ruler or they elect the ruler or they appoint the ruler so on and so on. So essentially you have the MPs giving bay'ah on behalf of the people whom they represent, which is similar to the actual way that the bay'ah was traditionally conducted throughout Islamic history. I mean, historically, the Khalifa was not elected by a popular vote. He was selected by, for example, tribal leaders or other influential members of the Muslim community who would give bay'ah on behalf of the people. This group of people who gave the bay'ah were known as the Ahl al-Hal wal aqd hmm. the people who tie and untie, or bind and unbind. And it just means the most powerful, influential, elite members of the society. So yes, you can say that in these countries, in the majority of Muslim countries, the rulers do possess the necessary consent to rule. Now, if you're talking about Muslim countries that have monarchies, like say Morocco or Jordan, where the king does still have considerable power, he doesn't have absolute power. You still have elected legislatures. And the king and the royal family, the monarchies generally, in Jordan and in Morocco, uh, in uh, Brunei, for example, they have the support of tribal leaders, industrialists, powerful business people, and other influential players in society. In other words, they have the support of what could be called the Ahl al-Hal wal aqd in their countries, in the Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia, like Qatar, like the UAE. The ruling families absolutely have the support of the largest families and tribes in their territories, and they do literally receive bay'ah from them. Now, what he's talking about, this sort of stereotype of the you know, imposed dictator ruler in a Muslim country, that maybe only accurately applies to countries that were Muslim majority countries that were formerly part of the Soviet Union, like say Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and so on, where there is pretty purely autocratic rule. However, you can be certain that even in these countries, those rulers have the endorsement of the most powerful, influential, uh, corporate, business, military, and intelligence components of the society. The most influential and powerful players in their countries support the ruler. Which brings us back to Egypt and Pakistan, where democratically elected rulers were overthrown. Mohamed Morsi in Egypt, and more recently in Pakistan, Imran Khan. Arguably, in both Egypt and Pakistan, the Ahl al-Hal al aqd is the military. And they appointed who they appointed. Now, none of these methods for installing a ruler are unheard of in the history of the Khilafah. And none of these methods invalidates 
the bay'ah requirement because bay'ah does not necessitate popular democratic elections, but only the approval or the endorsement of the most prominent elite segments of the community. I think it's fair to say that you would be hard pressed to find a Muslim ruler in any Muslim country who does not enjoy the support of the elites in his country, whether those are tribal leaders, industrialists, business leaders, or the army. It's kind of an awkward conundrum for these Khilafahist type people in that they insist that Khilafah is the only valid form of government and that democracy is kufr. But then they usually find themselves arguing for Khilafah on the basis of democratic legitimacy. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was not elected by popular vote. He was selected by committee. And there were various methods for appointing a Khalifa and establishing his legitimacy ever since. And none of these methods was by popular mandate. Now, I have nothing against popular mandate, but you cannot honestly claim that popular mandate, popular vote, election, what have you, is the prerequisite for establishing the contractual legitimacy of a government, of a ruler, and that only by popular mandate is that ruler then covered by the rights that are granted to him in the hadiths by Rasulullah about obedience. The truth of the matter is that we had rulers who were appointed by the elites of society for over a thousand years, and that is what we still have in many places alongside a couple dozen countries where they have democratically elected rulers. So yes, those hadiths apply today, whether we like it or not. Now, if the elites, if the Ahl al-Hal wal aqd of our societies who are appointing the rulers, if those people are corrupt, that's a separate issue. And perhaps it would be more useful for you to try to address that issue rather than rebelling against the rulers. Jazakumullahu khairan wa Okay, that's the end of that video. I'm sure there's plenty to comment on there. Uh, now, I, actually, he, he succeeded putting his tahrir in a corner and uh, other people like that because the problem is that the, the shah of the Hizb is arguing uh, the wrong way in matter of the, the rebellion and in, in two fundamental errors by him and uh, personally arguing about the issue of bay'ah, etc. Um, and... Uh, and this is the problem has because has does not accept said by but does not accept election and democracy and declare democracy to be kufr without distinguishing between democracy as a philosophy as referring to the people as the ultimate sovereign or as procedures and way of governance so that's the that's 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 the sole point of uh, but also jihadi that's where they they have broke their own legs that's number one. so he caught him in this one Secondly, he caught him because he's talking about the hadith, etc., and, uh, and uh, the, the obedience to the ruler, even if do that, unless cover of the one of Hizb Tahir, and also Brother Shahid, they both accept that as, as given and as fundamental. And uh, uh, and then the one of Hizb Tahir was forced to go back to the bay'ah. This applies only for one who has a legitimate bay'ah or legitimate election. Okay, let's address two issues. The issue of bay'ah and red, we leave that because this, I don't think it's a disagreement between both. What is the type of the bay'ah and all these definitions of al-hal wal aqd is a fine point of what is called Sultan Ummah, the authority of the Ummah. I leave that at the side. It's a bit complex and we'll clarify that, inshallah. But the first one, all these ahadith, which have said, said, said many ahadith, there's not really many ahadith. All what we have the ahadith concerning the rulers, the sahih ahadith. We have the hadith of Um Salama from Al Hassan al Basri. Most likely, this is one faulty. Is all channels are Al Hassan al Basri and Dabba Dabba al Anazi, al Anazi, and Um Salama. And Al Hassan al Basri is modelless. An cannot be accepted from, especially if the matter there is a question mark on it. And besides the term modelless, Al Hassan al Basri is also someone who is sometimes interjecting a hadith because usually he's not sitting like a formal later generation who sit and read from the book and the, from the book and the student write down the hadith. He's a man of politics, a man of wa'ad, a man of public affairs. So he mentioned statement of the then he interjects his comment, then go back to hadith and reject the comments. And that's clear in that hadith itself. But independent of that, there's no there's no reliability on that it's not. Always say a Muslim, but some mistake. The same apply for Two of his major interesting hadith, which the one about no, no people will succeed uh, allegedly from Abu Bakr and from Sayyid Allah, no people will succeed if they appoint a woman as their leader. That's the hadith is fabricated. It's a fabrication of some sons of Abu Bakr. And it's also mudallas. 
عن أبي بكر is not I hear the Just to clarify before you so uh, obviously not everyone knows what, what مدلس is. This hadith in Bukhari, yeah. What, what, مدلس is when you drop a chain because. No, no, مدلس is عن and reality is عن meaning just uh, is reaching from this one. There may be someone in between. It skips someone who may be contentious. That's the idea. No, uh, it skips someone. Contentious is not contentious. مدلس is the one who عن is not necessary in the meaning that حدثنا. Normal meaning of عن حدثنا. I got that from from you. Meaning, you told me that. Mm -hmm. so that's in, in, the, in the language of Muhaddithin, the time Sahaba and Tabi'in and so on. That's the standard. But some people use an, they don't say hadathana because if you say hadathana and he did not tell you or you hear or a hint from, then you are lying. But he drops that either deliberately, that could be tadadis amt, which is very negative and very, very, very bad, or not amt, just it very cheap from Abu Bakr. Because your memory is not that good, etc. I give an example. Of, I don't think it's a, a matter of hadith, but just for, for those who will be shocked to know that this hadith is fabricated. Another hadith, uh, again, Hassan and an, 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 an Abu Bakr, again the same, fabricated by the sons of Abu Bakr, who were criminals. But it's a long study. We have that we're completing it very soon. Uh, is that uh, Mr. Yola is saying, Mr. Yola is saying about Al Hassan. <laughs> Mr. Yola is saying about, 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 about Hassan ibn Ali that my son is a Sayyid, is a, is a master. Allah will bring him two, two groups of Muslims together. That's fabricated to exonerate Muawiyah. But it's not. Mr. Yola never said that. Anyway, so that's one. Second, another hadith is come with Shami Isnad in two words. One word is that they will be rulers when you, you see things which you don't like. Which you don't like. If you see something you don't like, then don't pull your hand from Ta'a. Another version, two versions. Some ruler would be someone the same way they would don't like from the disobedience to Allah. If you see that, don't pull your hand from Ta'a. So we have two, uh, we have two, two, uh, two, two words, but they're fundamentally different. So there's a problem with this hadith, there's the matan you cannot rely. Most method mentioned books of the hadith is the one Nazian Zayada is a people who you see something which you don't dislike from obedience to Allah. Someone will say, uh, How can I dis uh, dislike something from a ruler which is not his obedience to Allah? Yeah, very well. Maybe the ruler is very tough. He levies strong tax, he levies heavy taxes, saying uh, these taxes are needed for uh, national defense and so on. With the approval of Shura, you don't like him. You, you hate that from him, but uh, that don't, that's not a justification. Uh, maybe he is very strict in treatment of people. Maybe he's not merciful like a previous ruler who was gentle and merciful. Maybe he's not granting so much benefit and things like that. But it's all, all mubah. That's not from obedience to Allah. So you see that hadith is questionable. All the hadith which passes that and, and the only one in Bukhari, by the way, the hadith of Kufr Muah. That's number one. Secondly, the hadith, they obey uh, even if they are tyrant, if they're killing and so on. That's not true. That's now the mistake. The, most of these hadith are narrated in a, in a in a cut, uh, partly cut form. Most of the hadith are mentioned, like for example, Hadith Ka'b ibn Ujra. May Allah protect you from rules which come after me, who, who do this and this and this, uh, uh, who do whatever they are not ordered to do, and say what they are not, uh, not telling the truth. Who, and the hadith goes, uh, whoever approves their doing, or, uh, or, or, or declare that their lies are, are true, has nothing to do with me, Yom al -Qiyama. I have broken the relation with him. And if, if that happens, then whoever fights them with his hand is a believer. Who fights him with his, with, with, with his tongue is a believer. Who would fight with, with, with his struggle against is not fight, jihad. When jihad on biyadihi, fahuwa mu'min. When jihad on bilisani, fahuwa mu'min. When jihad on biqalib, fahuwa mu'min. Whoever object to that by, by his hand, which usually means rebellion, or with the tongue, or with his heart, those are believers. Anyone who does not do that, he has nothing to do with Iman, he's out of the whole of Islam. And many hadith of Umar al Munkar are originating from this type of hadith, and these are the ones who are mutawatir. There's no hadith said that if they uh, if they kill and maim and so on, you obey them. And then we hadith, the famous hadith about which is, in most books you will find only the front part narrated. When the Messenger of Allah visited a group of of people from Quraysh in a in a in a, in, a, in a place or in a, in a or in a house. They all Qurayshi. He said he took the two, two sides of the door and said, "Is anyone uh, all of you Quraysh? Is anyone from, not from Quraysh between you?" 
obviously he did that on order of, 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 of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not just haphazard. He was not drunk. He's the messenger of Allah. Unfallible. They said, uh, 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 yes, except uh, one, one, one president is the son of our sister from another tribe, and one is a freed slave, Mawla. Say, Mawla al-Qawm a Mawla of Quraysh is Qurashi, and the son of your sister, even if his father was there, is also Quraysh. That's the first rule. That's uh, concerning genealogy. Leave that aside. And they said, Isma, listen, the Imam Quraysh, the Imams will be from Quraysh, the Imams after me will be from Quraysh. What's their characteristic and what's your due to them? Ma idha hakamu adalu. If they rule, they rule with justice. Wa idha wa'adaw wa faw. If they give, if they promise, they fulfill their promise. Wa idha sturhimu rahimu. If they are asked for mercy, only if they ask for mercy, they give mercy. Obviously, it's better if you give mercy without being asked. That's clear. But that's the minimum. They have the rights on you, like my right on you in that case. Whoever does not comply with these three, Allah scares. And the case of the angels are the case of people on him. That's you find everywhere. This hadith. But a water from Anas ibn Malik, narrated many people going to Anas ibn Malik. But you don't find, except in rare places, that you have to search for it. And we have a research, I think it's a, a is it translated? It's not translated. Is it translated? Rush? Which, 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 which one? The hadith, what I'm just telling that. No, because there's stuff in Hakimiyah. There's quite a bit in Hakimiyah. No, no, no. This hadith physically is a complete research. I wrote it with the appendix. What's the name of the title? I'll, I'll be able to check. Yeah, no, okay. It's in Arabic, anyway, available. Okay. So that's where most narrators, including Musnad Ahmad, unfortunately, and many hadith scholars, right? they stop who, after, in that point and they continue. They were afraid because some of them were, were almost killed because they narrated the whole hadith. What's that he's saying? فَإِلَّمْ يَفْعَلُوا Because the curse of Allah and the angels is on them. That's no doubt. That's for Akhira to be certain. That's clear. فَإِلَّمْ يَفْعَلُوا if they don't do, if they don't rule with justice and fulfill their promise and give mercy if they ask for mercy, exterminate them by the sword. Put your sword on your shoulder, that's usually the button, you put your sword like that and go in the button. That's a meaning word. Exterminate them. What happens if you don't do that? فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَكُنُوا حَرَّاتِينَ أَشْقِيَاءَ تَأْكُلُونَ مِنْ كَدَّابِ And then you will be miserable serfs and the few that the, the time the, the, the farmer are usually serfs and the few the lords, almost like slaves. Even if they're not formally slaves, they are essentially slaves. Then be harrathina ashka, miserable serfs, eating just from their handiwork. That's all. Living just to eat from hand, from mouth to air. From mouth to air. That's all. Then be happy with this life. That's the life you will suffer to be serfs. Then be happy with being serfs. Don't expect Allah to help you with anything else. That's it. And that's that, that later part was someone told the Al Mahdi Al Abbasi, and this Mahdi is not Mahdi. His name is Mahdi, but he is misguided. He's not a guided one. Because the translation of Mahdi is the guided one. He's not a guided one. One, one of his, his, his cronies uh, told him uh, Sharik al Qadi is, is narrating this hadith. So he ordered him to be brought before him. He said, Did you narrate this hadith? Say, Qadi, no, I never narrated this hadith. And the man said, turned to that, how will you lie against Qadi Sharik? And the man said, I am obliged to divorce my wife and do this and do and do a hajj walking without without sandals and so on. If he had if he, if I am lying, he told me the hadith. And he turned to Sharik said, You see what he said? He said, I didn't say it. On me is on what is on him. And then he says to you see. He made an oath, you must be lying. I say, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifa, this man is the most intelligent Arab. And he said, Aliyah ma'ali, he means he has clothes the same way that I have clothes. Tell him to make an explicit oath like my oath. Now, Khalifa al-Mahdi, the unguided Mahdi, turned to, to Sharik say, make an oath exactly like he did, that your wives are divorced, that you will go to Mecca walking with those sandals. And then Sharik was stuck now. Said, yes, I narrated. Said, wait. From whom did you hear this hadith? Who narrated? Say, Al Amash. Say, Waili Al Sharib al Khabr. Wow. If I knew where it is his grave, I will dig him out of the grave and burn him. 
and the story continues. It's in that in that research. So that's one hadith. And this is and this with this method is narrated through Amash and Sitra Salim ibn Abdul Jad from Thauban from Messenger of Allah. But it's not only from Thauban, it comes also from Umhan ibn Abi Talib. It comes also from uh Nu'man ibn Bashir. And it comes also from another Sahabi that I will remember, Anas ibn Ba'al. Or each one of them with good isnat. The one of Salim al-Jihad is excellent isnat. So the claim that we are ordered to obey if this was your own is nonsense. So that's the first premise. This premise is faulty. We are not obliged to obey. And actually encouraged for rebellion, which shows the point of view, this man's point of view, and the point of view of classical scholar, and in the in out, outside the Islamic law, the point of view the, of Hobbes, I think the Hobbian point of view in the British history of law and so on, is the wrong one. Why is it the wrong one? Because the instruction of the of Allah did not come from himself. He's not a philosophy of state or society. He's not a philosophy of, of epistemology. It's not a philosophy of, of uh, divine freedom and destiny and, 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 and uh, no, he was a simple man. Uh, at best, what he mastered before he received revelation was a shepherd and a bit of commerce as well. That's all what he mastered. Otherwise, he has nothing and he was illiterate. So it has come from Allah's seven, seven heavens, heavens. And this is the correct cure. What comes from Allah's seven heavens is the truth. Not what people think is the truth. Not that what people think is the truth. That's not, that's not what, what people think. So that's it. And there's many other hadith. Hadith Ka'b ibn Ujra, all of them encourage people to jihad, make jihad against it with the hand. If they cannot do that, then with the tongue. If you cannot do that, then at least with the heart. Reject them with the heart. Hate them. Wear them. Educate your children and next generation to, to get ready to get rid of them. So this is the first fundamental premises, uh, which the one of Hizb al-Tahrir fell under. What they relied on? They relied on some fabricated hadith some question of hadith and left the other ones which are, have been unfortunately scattered in the books and never brought in one place because bringing them in one place will make the fact become so clear and apparent that you are in a state of shock. But if you scatter them in the books, you don't see them. What you find in the books, even the books of Aqidah, is only the hadith in Bukhari, and one or two hadith. And that's what Barad al-Shahid said. So you can't blame him. That this at least this cover up, this playing game, this cheating, and hiding what the Messenger of Allah said is, is committed by Ahmed ibn Hanbal and previous scholars. Yes, unfortunately, we have to face this bitter reality. So that's the first one. Secondly, the issue of, of al hal al aqd that's the second one. Hizb al is wrong in saying democracy is covered. This is general, what is meaning with democracy? Democracy means democracy, ruling, uh, ruling of the people. And the word ruling has various meanings. In Quran, if you summarize the meaning of ruling, it could be meaning a the fundamental enactment of, of, of principles of law and uh, declaring what is permissible and not permissible, what pleases Allah does do with This ruling is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another way of ruling is formulating laws and enactment. That's very well can be done by others. The Messenger of Allah formulates ru 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 uh, rulings. But based on what? What he re received from revelation. Scholar formulate rulings and put book, books of fiqh. But based on what? What they think is a revelation, according to the best ishtihad. If they are mujtahid, or they are cheating, or if they are munafiq and kafir, it can't be that and that. You would never say that the one who writes a book of fiqh is really a true believer and really refer to Allah's messenger. Maybe he's doing, maybe he's not. But he's covering up. Could be. We don't know. Because he's not inf infallible. The same apply for, for uh, governments and, 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 and uh, parliaments. They are the law. Did they did you from Allah Messenger discussed it with this intention? Maybe, maybe not. So ruling could be, but then we have the judicial rulings. Judges do ruling. So the word ruling is is is, is very confusing in democracy. It may be, but the Greek meant that's the ruling of the people, the people are the ultimate sovereign. Then this is kufr. There's no ultimate sovereign. There's only one ultimate sovereign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It cannot be the people, it cannot be the king, it cannot be anybody in the universe. If they mean something else, if they manage the affairs and they refer to the gods or something else, that's something else. So this is, and that's, uh, and that's what, what makes it uh, a little bit uh, uh, troublesome to use the word democracy. But I would say, uh, obviously, Hizb is very sensitive to that because it believes that all democracy is covered. That's a mistake. And also some jihadi. I would say we use the word democracy as a substitute or similar to, 
to, to the statement or the principle of Sultan al Ummah, the authority of the Ummah. That the Ummah is having the authority, every one of them, not Al Hal Aqd or anything like that. That's obviously it has to be deduced from Quran Sunnah for many evidences. There's no one single state ever. We can say there is some statement which shows that the ultimate the authority is the Ummah. For example, let me give an example. Uh, although it, it, it is it, it referred to what happened to Bani Israel after they left Egypt, but it is obviously this Ummah is having better even uh, better even standing in matter of authority of their authority than the, the Bani Israel. When Musa tells the people, remember the favor of Allah upon you. Remember the favor of Allah on you who made you kings, make you kings. You own your own destiny. You are master of your own self. You own yourself. Obviously, Musa does not mean that the ultimate sovereign. It's clear. He cannot be. And made between you also prophets. So Bani Israel, became, after they left Egypt, they became, everyone became his own king. Everyone, he's addressing everyone. He made you kings. He made you kings. And they were managing by the prophets and by the tribal chieftains, but they, everyone has authority. And they were doing it by consultation. Although the prophets were managing, running the affairs, according to the hadith, Kanat Bani Israel, Fasusumul Anbiya, Usatakun Khulavan, Fatakthum. And then he said, Fu bayat al awwal al awwal. If the hadith is authentic, I think it's authentic, and nobody is arguing about it. It's very clear. And the hadith is very clear. The people of Israel, the people say, were managing by the prophets. So we will say, How come? The, the, the wood and Sulaiman and Talut, yes, starting with Talut, with Saul, they chose monarchy. The Quran mentioned that story in Surah Al Baqarah that they asked to appoint a king, and the prophet. Uh, and uh, to uh, allegedly that they want to perform jihad. For to perform jihad, they need a king allegedly. The Quran mentioned the story of only abridged and rebuked them that they did not do the jihad as they claimed and did not go in the details of the story. But you go to the first book of Samuel to see what the full story. It's a shameful story. It's a real shame. The people have tried, uh, decided to give up, uh, to give up on 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 on, on freedom and. Uh, 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 independence and uh, single personality and became slave to a king. And the prophet warned them that they would be enslaved by the king. They would be oppressed by the king and they still insisted. And Allah granted that. Eh? Allah is a sovereign. He can grant it. He can make it permissible. So this crux of, so the crux of this uh, argument about Bayah and... So the argument about Bayah is, is ineffective here. Definitely all these obediences on... Uh, is, is, is obliged only to one he has a valid bayah. How is the bayah is valid? It's a very complex because clearly uh, there's no way everyone will be able to give bayah personally. There will be a representative given or a majority given directly. We have had in Islamic history majority given bayah direct one by one. We have that. And also what he mentioned Abu Bakr by committee is not true. Abu Bakr was not by committee. Abu Bakr was discussing with the people of Saqifa and then this was not a valid bayah making him only in the masjid when everyone came. Everyone came in Medina. It was about a Muslim outside. And Medina was at the siege by Murtadina so on at that time. There was no way to communicate at that time. With so the people in Medina was sufficient representation and behalf of them. But everyone gave bayah. Everyone. There was no community or military. In the case of Omar, yes, Abu Bakr did the, did the, the process of, of, of like, like a choice committee. And they suggested that Omar should be given bayah after him. And everyone gave bayah, including Ali or, or Omar. In time of Uthman, some, some mistakes have happened, but Abu Rahman ibn Awf said, I am not interested in it. I will do the job which Abu Bakr did. And he checked with everyone in Medina, men and women. But they didn't check outside. At the time, it was not feasible. But at the time, also, there was a good reason. Would have been a good reason if they decided to restrict on If they said liberty, I thought they, dist they distinguished themselves to the way in Medina out of necessity. Because it's impossible to communicate to any reasonable time and get the voice from elsewhere. Uh, at that time, it would have been permissible to do that, the Uthman and Ali also. But Ali insisted to ask uh, all everywhere in the world to send him the bay'ah in writing. And camel, camel laws of bay'ah came from everywhere, except from Sham when Mu Muammar started his rebellion and b broke the back of the Ummah after that. So it's not, no, not a military and not a sh tribal chieftains. That's not true. Now, why Medina, even if they have restricted, would have a, a certain reason? The same reason is that Medina is the place where Muhajirin and Ansar, are, 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 are the Sabiqin and Awaleen, essentially are living, except few who are in the battle campaign outside. 
and then Muhajir Ansar as you curated by Quran and give a special standing. But there's only one generation. For that generation, when we discuss the ayah in Tafsir, in the last halak of Tafsir, so this specific group of people, maybe 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, they, Allah declared that he pleased with them, hinting that these are the cream, la cream of the ummah. This is the cream, la cream of, la cream of the ummah. In that generation, until they are all gone, you can say, if they give bay'ah, that binds everyone. It's not conceivable that anybody else will dare argue with them or they not regard them as, but, but this is an ummah or a nation in creation, in emergence. After they have all passed away, the ummah is well established and there is no difference between a scholar and the street sweeper. No, none. No difference. All of them are part of the authority. Even before that, for example, we have many stories about for example, at the time of Prophet Salam, Zainab, his daughter, gave protection to her husband, ex-husband. He was not cohabiting with her, but he was taken, uh, he, he ran away from a battlefield and it, it took refuge at uh, Zainab. And then they were searching for him around everywhere because they knew he was there in the in a caravan or something like that. And then Zainab lifted the veil and told his, 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 because she lives in the, near the, in the masjid. Uh, and the Messiah was sitting with, with, the, with the people around him, and she said, listen, uh, you don't need to search for Fulan or Fulan, I don't remember his name, uh, uh, you don't need to search for him, he's with me, I gave him protection. And the Messiah said, do you see what this, this woman is saying, my daughter is saying, Wallahi, by Allah, I have no idea that that's happened. That's number one. So he's not with his contestation, he's not with his knowledge. That's number one. Secondly, but we have to we have to accept her giving given protection and giving uh, giving uh, 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 asylum even a single brother because the Muslims are one ummah even the lowest of them can grant asylum and it's binding on everyone else. That's in time of the messenger of Allah. Yes, professor, and 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 even the slave who gave um, uh, who gave the peace um, uh, for, for, in time of Omar. Yeah. Exactly, but I but I want to say here something very short. That's, uh, uh, tell the story. The story is that slave uh, put a, 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 there was a people for in a fortification. They were they were very difficult to be to, to end the siege with them. So he suggested he came to the idea. Let me suggest to him a certain settlement which end that uh, that siege, and he put it in an arrow and sent it to them. So they find that suggestion suggestion was very reasonable and wise. So they can also accept your suggestion. Say, what suggestion? Say, this one. They say, we did not send that. Say, it's from you. It came in an hour. And they turn out the man who sent it. Yes, I sent that. They say, this is sent by a slave. Say, we don't know who is a slave from you. You are a, a battle campaign. We kind of distinguish who is a slave and who is free. Make your mind. You accept that or you go back in, 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 in the fortification and continue fighting. Say, okay, we don't do anything until we ask Omar. So they to Omar. This happened, and the slave, our own slave, a bondsman, is, did that. So Umar wrote to them, a slave of the Muslimin is one of the Muslimin, and his dhimma, his covenant, is the covenant of the Muslimin. His suggestion, accepted by the side, is binding. So, uh, so Brother Shahid did not know these things, unfortunately. That's, you don't find usually in the books of Fiqh in the Bible, Imama. You find it somewhere in, in, in the books about akhlaq, about nice manners, things like that. Also, the premise... About, about, about spirituality and things like that. We don't find it where it belongs. In well, one, other, one, other in flawed, one other very flawed premise that we have to effectively uh, immunize ourselves from is this idea of somehow acts that happened before is somehow some kind of an Islamic legal precedent. Allah and his messenger are our reference point. Going back to yeah, some of this, this, this historical event, if we start referring, I mean, because the thing is that, you know, it's one way of you know, saying we had numerous oppressive regimes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then to say that is a standard, and therefore to form justification, it should uh, be that's, now, now, now that's that's now that's the point. If that's clear now, that these hadith are mostly fabricated, which they invoke, even even the brother of Hanzalir, at most scholars are, they they are questionable. They're questionable, because if you go to the Quran, there's no mention of al Amr in two places. Right? Ati Allah, Ati Rasul, all al Amr minkum. So all the Amr are joined to the, the, the Prophet as a footnote, not an independent. There's no say, they say, obey Allah and obey his messenger. 
with a separate obey, obey and obey because the obedience to messengers is equal to obedience to Allah by necessity of the Quran and necessity of reason. And then they don't say obey the, the, the one in charge, is there? And or the one in charge attached to the Prophet. And then after they said, if you dispute with them or dispute in anything, including dispute with the rulers, they refer to Allah and His Messenger. There must be some judicial system to settle these disputes. And if he does not accept a judicial, like, like a constitutional court, which gives a final judgment, if he doesn't accept and he's rebelling, and this is Kufr Bah, and then you fight him. But it's the details of rebellion we discuss elsewhere, the fine details. That's the fundamental point. Another place shows where Ulul Amr are prominently referred to and must be referred to is that when Allah rebukes the Munafiqeen who are spreading rumors and gossip. They hear about, for example, there's news that maybe an army is, is, is coming or some, some things happening far away which we don't know exactly what's going. Maybe uh, uh, someone came from, from, from a, a trip of a business trip from Sham and saw that, for example, the Ghassani king is preparing an army. Maybe he's preparing an army to fight the Persian. We don't know. How do you know that? That's coming to mind. He comes to say, the Ghassani are preparing uh, an army and they're uh, about to attack, uh, well, he's something, some rumors, and attack, attack, attack Medina. Maybe he's not. Maybe it's true. But what he does, he comes to the message and say it publicly. And Allah rebuked that person. If they receive some news about which related to security and to, to fear, etc., they say it publicly and make make uh, to terrify the people. If they had referred it back to the messenger and those who are in charge of them, they would have known how to deal with the matter properly before terrifying the people and making them on edge. That's, that's only that application. That's the way you should deal with issues of security. You don't say go in publicly or put it in social media and in modern time, you report to the authority, the legitimate authority, the mission messenger or Amr ibn Hum. You have to have authority of this rank of legitimacy, not to the British authority or the American authority, no respect, no disrespect to anybody. But okay, uh, so just, uh, just, just to, to recap, so we're, we're talking about they so, are... so, that's, so that's what all the Quran or the earlier Amr says. The rest is, is referred to Sunnah, and the Sunnah is very clear if you take all evidences and not, uh, and, and not be fooled by some uh, questionable fabricated hadith, or at least some wording which have been twisted out of their place in some hadith, which may be still partly authentic, but not fully authentic in that wording. Am I okay to start the next video now? Because um, uh, I will brace yourself. It does have some um, even more questions. So I don't, I don't really blame Brother Shahid for that because this is really the uh, overwhelmingly common point of view and which is being hammered through history in the head of the people. And more but, importantly now as well, the amount of um, the amount of machinations around the issue of ruling and in terms of obedience to the ruler, the you know as good was it um, was it Goebbels who said that if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes a fact. That's become cemented in people's minds, which is yeah. why it needs to be broken. It, uh, it's, for example, Hakimi, even though the, the book itself is 20 years old, um, it goes through every single isnad on the issue of uh, ruling and some of the um, you know, rebellion, the whole issue of um, Daos, the whole issue of if someone rules by kufr. So, for example, rule by kufr or someone become kafir. It's it's all in there, and that's 20 years old. So it's, it's you know it's, it's it's a compelling argument, and uh, inshallah. We invite people to to read the material, and it's you know his Tahrir, for example, adopt it. It's it'll it'll provide you with significant ammunition to destroy this idea. But 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 I say the problem him that he shot himself in the face in, in the foot. It did not go to the issue of obedience for in the fundamental the fundamental philosophical to get a philosophical point. Uh, it is a fundamental principle of Islam is that what is in what in 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 ayat al in ayat al uh, uh, la fi rejected is the, the narrow meaning in anyone who attributes to himself sovereignty. That's a ta'ut. You have not, not only to say he's a ta'ut and he is a, he doesn't have a sovereignty. That's a statement of fact. Note that you have to reject him. And if necessary, if necessary, fight it. يؤمن بالله. Meaning, يؤمن بالله as the ultimate sovereign, as the only Rabb, the only Lord. So, based on that, it is prohibited to have obedience to anybody except Allah SWT unless you get an order from Allah SWT otherwise. 
So obedience to anybody except Allah Subhanahu wa Taala because of sovereignty is to Allah. What's the meaning of sovereignty? It has two sides. Sovereignty meaning the one who is ultimate uh, right of enacting laws and defining this is good, this is evil, and this is good. Do it. You must do it. It's desirable to do it, and this evil avoid it, or you must avoid it. In the fairest time, yeah. That, that's the that's the meaning of ultimate sovereignty. So from a human side, you look at sovereignty is like a coin. One side is is, is hakimiya. The other side is obedience. So if there's the oldest, then he's the only one deserving obedience. So how come that there's anyone deserve any obedience anywhere? Nobody deserve obedience. Nobody. Unless there's an evidence, and this must be an unrefutable, absolutely established evidence. Now, when we establish, if you have established the Quran is from Allah with certitude, the Quran says clearly, the obedience to the messengers is obligatory on us by divine permission and injunction. Without with Allah permission. Not because they are messengers, not because they have beautiful eyes and nice beard. No, by Allah permission. Obedience to the parents, nowhere in the Quran, by the way. We are ordered to be charitable with the parents, but not to obey them, by the way. This is one of the trickery of the classical scholarship. No, you are not obliged to obey the parents. You are obliged to be charitable to them. So if your father tell you, divorce your wife, tell them, thank, thank you, dad. That's not your business. I have to decide that. But if you want me to go shopping for you or come clean your toilet, I'll do. Professor, uh, just before moving in, I just want yeah, to... Yeah, I just mentioned that one said. So there's yeah. no deserve obedience. So if you have, if you say the rule of the obedience, if he kills, bring me the evidence, chase that clearly. No who else said, even the fabricated hadith, even if he kills and so on. That's what, what scholars claim. Some scholars, both I, either, uh, either um, um, what do you call it, uh, people who are simple-minded, idiotic, or treasonous scholars say. Or these fabricated the hadith, which have to be to be to to, to be exposed and be fabricated. Yes, uh, Professor, I just want to highlight something. In the there's a contradiction in the brother's talk when he said that the Ahl al Halwa al Aqd are uh, representatives of the Ummah, and the Ummah uh, is not obligated to give. Um, to clear, give... that's clear. No, we, I didn't discuss that because we, we are clear. Yes, just I, tell I, him. I, look, look at the American system. The only the only the al Aqd is the parliament which is elected, ultimately going to election. The president Absolutely. is coming from the uh, 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 college, uh, the president of the election college, electoral college, and these are elected from the people, ultimately Absolutely. from the people of the authority. Yes, but here the brother brother Shahid is is giving the impression that uh, that the election of Ahl al Halwa al Aqd is binding, even if the Ummah did, did, did not want that election. No, no, he, no, no, he is faulty fundamentally. The Ahl al Aqd do not exist. Does not make any sense. It's a construct hmm. because the classical scholars faced the problem that all Khalifa and Muawiyah did not have a bayah. So they said, actually, the leaders of the army, the business people, the heavy of the society approve them. And these are the ones who somehow bind and tie in behalf of the ummah, somehow. Yes. And, and here I want to I wanna quote. Uh, but this is fa 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 it's fa it's fallacy. How do we know they somehow bind and love the ummah? Where do you find the word ahl hal aql or similarly in Quran and Sunnah? Nowhere. Professor, here, here, here I want to quote uh, Ibn Taymiyyah when he said that Abu Bakr did not be became a, a, a caliph by the election of Ahl al-Hal wal -Aqd. He became a caliph the next day when, when the general public, they gave them the bay'ah. So, so he, mean, he means by the, by, by the bay'ah in Saqifah. The bay'ah in Saqifah. Because uh, Saqifah are not Ahl al-Hal wal -Aqd. It's a part of the ummah. Part of the ummah. And, and the ummah should, should give the, the general public, should give the bay'ah for a caliph in order for him. Yeah, to but this is so obvious. Way. This is so obvious. Otherwise, we'll stay a long time discussing Saqifa. You mm. should refer. I think Saqifa is translated. If you have contact with this brother Shahid, Saqifa is available in, the in English. It can send to him. We can send it. in the comments. So, okay. so that's it. So we don't go into to find details now by answer because it's a complex area. No doubt it's complex. But this construction of the classical school, especially Mawardi and Abu Al Al Farra in Ahkam Sultan Yadibir, Al Hal Al Aqd is an imaginary construction to get out of the dilemma. Because otherwise, they say there is no bay'ah. So they have to construct an imaginary bay'ah. Like the, the like people constructed something called the Phoenix. Or in Arabic, Al Rukh Al Anqa. Al Anqa is the Phoenix, a bird which blows fire. There's no bird like that. 
the only in the imagination, in the metaverse, not in the real universe. Or the people were South Park man babying. Uh, <laughs> so the Im next? Well, imagination, imagine a construction. Imagine a construction to save. So the conclusion from that, which we have to face bitterly now, and Hizb Tahrir has to review his old theory, is to go to say, from the usurpation of the Munafiq Kafir Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Allah. Until now, no ruler except few scattered here and there got a bayah. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz got a bayah after that when he cancelled the operation of Bani Umayyah. The people accepted him and they sent him letters, they sent him poetry, they sent delegation, which clearly expressed all people, not the army, not Bani Umayyah, but the Umayyah was, were plotting to kill him and they killed him and poisoned him. That's one. Al Ma'mur may have some, something like that because his brother wanted to remove him from the, from the, uh, from the uh, allocation of his father, and then based on that, he said, but, but then wide section of scholars and, 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 and army supported him. Mm, I don't know if we can, we have to study that in detail because maybe he has, maybe he has some kind of popular support, by uh, maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe not, we don't know. But uh, later on, the scholars facing this problem when things become more systematic, like Al Mawardi, when he uh, wrote his, uh, his, his uh, magnum opus, Al uh, Hakam Sultaniya. He faced this dilemma with what he's supposed to do. Then he has to construct Taiha. But that's it. Let me say, mention something on the Shia side. The people think the Shia believe that is Nasr, and Nasr Ilahi, that the divine appointment to Imam. That was not the Ilya point of view. But, uh, and Dawla Bwahiya, the, the Bani Boya, who controlled the Khilaf Abbasiyah in its mid time, until relatively late. They on the Turks, Al Al Basar came. They they were Zaidi, and the Zaidi point of view is that the the Imam should be in the Ahl al Bayt. They have the first right, but with one condition: the Imam has to go out with the sword and claim his Imam by force, which is a faulty point of view. But but this was this point of view is a problem for the for the Bani Boya. They didn't go out with the sword; they were appointed by the Abbasi. So they adopted the man. I think is the Sheikh Al Mufid and Nu'man. Anyway. And uh, he, he fabricated this theory of, uh, of Nasr Imama and the Imam like appointed. And uh, in the time of, of, of Ghaiba, uh, uh, nobody can rebel and you have to obey. And this was very nice for a boy. Because they are Zaidi, they are supposed to go out with the sword. Now they can't sleep nicely because nobody can do politics or accept an Imama until either someone calls from heaven or the one in, in, the, in the tunnel comes out. Then you can't sleep until all eternities. I'm just mentioning that casually. Uh, maybe uh, people interested should follow brother uh, Ustad Ahmed al Katib about this, who uh, develop all the story and give all the uh, uh, how much fabrication around the whole story happens. So that's the situation. That's the situation. That's all, all later fabrication. Never existed yet. yet. And the, some hadith were fabricated, especially in the Shia, some hadith fabricated, put back to the Messenger of Allah. They have even a, a story where it's not going to Ajabr ibn Abdullah. That Messenger Allah said him, Do you know who will be Imam after me? It will be Ali, Al Hassan, uh, Hussein, Fulan, Fulan, mentioned it all by name until the last one. <laughs> so, mockery for same human beings, but that's, that's what has happened, unfortunately. And millions of people were taken for a ride. When both the Sunni and the Shia come. Sunni by the Hal uh, the imaginary construction, which is less severe than that, that other one, but it's a severe. Because it justifies rulers who have no bayah. Okay. Now, if, the now if there's an illegitimate ruler who has no bayah, you have if you if if you have if you have the power and you you have sufficient power to remove them, then you are obliged because you are not allowed if you have power and you can't to keep to leave them in power. But if you don't have, then you can't. But you are not obliged to obey. You can obey or disobey as you wish. You are not sinful who disobeying. But that's, if you disobey, possibly the they will punish you and prosecute you if you are willing to take that fight. So it's left to you for your own choice. That's how I to mean, deal with a kufr ruler or with a tyrannical ruler. That's another issue. I mean, that's the crux of the point. If someone's going to advance a theory to say that you're obligated, then no, you no, 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 on one no. side say that, yeah, no. we should do this. Definitely but, yeah. not, because the nas of the Quran is absolute. Do not obey any athim, sinful, or kaf from them. Someone say he's at this thing, Al-Mushrikeen. No, he's at this thing, everyone, the whole humanity. Because Al-Mushrikeen, Mushrikeen, all of them kafir. That some of them are Atim or not Atim is irrelevant. Kufr is the major, it's Mutayana. 
So it addresses, don't obey anyone who's Athema Kafir. And the address to the messenger is addressed to every one of the Ummah unless there's a, a clear in a clear and irrefutable evidence that is specific for him. And this is not specific for him. So we are ordered not to obey any Athema uh, or any sinful or any. the moment you know someone is sinful, you are not obliged to obey him. And you can't tell him in face. You are sinful, I can't obey you. Even if it's a private sin between him and Allah, you know about that. Say, I'm not going to say that publicly, but you are a zani, I'm not going to obey you. And even more than that, in the Hakimiya, for example, the issue about the Kufr, yeah, Kufr that, that, you go in more fine details. Destroy it completely. It, and we challenge any madkhali to bring it on, inshallah. I'm going to go to the next video because there's two others. And um, brace yourself, it does get worse. That's not me typing. We may not need to add very much more because we settled most things. Have, have, everything will be great. You just reestablish the Khilafah, you implement Sharia, whatever that means. They never really specify because they can't. They say that if we have those things, we have Khilafah, we have Sharia, uh, everything's going to be wonderful. We can dictate our terms to the world. We'll be free, we'll be independent. Everything will be just and righteous and so on and so on and so on. Okay. Well, the thing here's the thing. We had that. We had the Khilafa, and it did not prevent colonialism from taking over our lands. It didn't prevent our economic subjugation. It didn't prevent our internal divisions. That didn't help us. So clearly, there are a lot of other problems, a lot of other challenges to establishing government, to establishing a state, to running a state, and to uh, organizing the affairs of the society, other than calling your government Khilafah and other than implementing Sharia. Now, I know that there's, you know, plenty of brothers and sisters out there who will claim that it is blasphemous to say that it is not enough to uh, organize the society successfully, but this is the truth. There are many, 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 many other things that you need in order to successfully run the society, in order to successfully run a state. That's simply not enough. It wasn't enough in the past, and this is the thing that the Islamists don't want to talk about. They don't want to tell you that. They want you to think that when we had the Khilafah, when we had the Sharia, everything was wonderful. And what they failed to mention is that it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough then, and it isn't enough now, and it won't be enough in the future. I mean, it's, it's always going to come down to uh, a human understanding and implementation. Like I've talked about before, in the Ottoman Empire, you had the Sharia and you had Qanun. Because the Sharia does not cover every issue. So they understood correctly that you do have to come up with some other types of legislation in order to run a state. It's tremendously dangerous to make the claim or to make a promise that the problem of corruption in government, the problem of injustice or the problem of oppression in government is that it is not the right form of government. And if we just have a different form of government and we have a, a government that we call Khilafah, then therefore all of the problems will be solved. You know, the problem of corruption is always going to be there. The problem of injustice is always going to be there. The problem of oppression is always going to be there. It always was there for the last 1,400 years under what was called Islamic government, under what was called Khilafah, under the Ottoman Empire, and before, and before, and before. So, I mean, like the entirety of our history, except for 30 years, we have dealt with oppression, we have dealt with injustice, we have dealt with corruption under what was according to everyone's, you know, consensus, Islamic government. We have to come to terms with the fact that government can be, according to the legal definition, Islamic, and also oppressive. It can be uh, the legal definition of Islamic, and it can also be unjust. It can also be corrupt, because that is what we have had. The correct position for, mm -hmm. for anyone who wants to see the society and the government become more Islamic become more uh, aligned with Islamic law, Islamic values, and the objectives of the Sharia, then the role of those people is to just be in a continuous struggle to make whatever the government is better. Islamic is being used as a synonym for perfect. It's like, well, maybe in the Ottoman Empire, they weren't doing it completely or correctly or rightly. In other words, maybe it just wasn't perfect. Well, no, it wasn't perfect. It was Islamic, but it wasn't perfect because those two things don't mean the same thing. Yes, maybe they did implement things incompletely. Maybe they didn't implement things imperfectly. Of course they did. <clears throat> Anyone will. Anyone who is 
people who's claiming that they can implement it perfectly is a liar. And this is sort of the, 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 the fundamental, at least implicit claim mm -hmm. of the Islamists. Overthrow the current regime, whatever current regime it is, overthrow that regime and put us in power. And then we will establish an Islamic government, which by definition must mean that it's a perfect, just, and righteous government. Well, that's a lie. <clears throat> believes that uh, they're a fool and they're being manipulated. Uh, and they are going down an extremely dangerous path. I'm speaking as someone who, ever since I became a Muslim, was for a very long time one of the people who believed in the idea of, you know, that it was like wajib for us to reestablish the Khilafah without ever actually bothering to look into what that even means. And whether or not, in actual legal definition, whether or not the governments that we have are or are not Islamic. Because, of course, the Islamists will say any government that we ourselves and our party is not running is by definition un-Islamic. You know, any government that is imperfect, any government that has oppression, any government that has injustice, any government that has corruption is by definition un-Islamic. No, that's not true by the legal definition. If that is true. I think it's, you know, we have to see I, I think and if the idea is clear, it's the same what we are answered here. He is the same blunder of Hizb Tahrir and his blunder. But the only thing, major problem with him, Brother Shahid, is that he said Islam does not cover everything, or Sharia does not cover everything. It's not true. That's we addressed that in at the beginning. He does misunderstand Sharia. Most likely understand only as Hudud and things like that. There's not as the comprehensive system of values and so on. That's number one. Secondly, he's still he's still stuck with, with the fabricated hadith. And we're completely ignoring the Quran and, uh, and, and the other hadith mutawatir, which has been deliberately or essentially scattered in, in the books here and there so that nobody can see them and need digging, which we have done some of it. I, I don't claim we dug everything. So that, that's the problem come from there. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the problem of the, but the problem is major for Hizb al because Hizb al insists that until, until 1924, it was somehow Islamic. I argue it was not. Uh, my argument is now it has developed slowly through time. It was very bitter and very difficult that since Muawiyah is our power, we have nearly uh, a system. They may be Munafiq rulers, so they're publicly Muslim and they're internally covered. And the general system that general qada, general personal affairs, the affairs of the people, and through history, the Khilafah was more or less like, uh, like concerned about uh, international affairs, uh, war and peace. Uh, a bit about maybe taxes and, and zakah. Uh, that's it. They were not involved in, in people's life very much. The, the state was not penetrating the society. The society could live separately uh, and manage its own affairs. They have their own schools. They have their own endowments. They have their own masjids. They have their own uh, scholarly uh, developments. Uh, and the state was barely in, uh, interacting with that. So there was, there, was, there was like a schism, essentially a schism. Nevertheless, the oppression and the, and the corruption and so on of the state did, did stain the society and poison it and in part, no doubt about that, but it because it was not interacting, it's not like the modern central state. The modern central is, 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 is a monster. It goes very deep, deep. Look, for example, the, the laws about LGBT here in, in the West and the counter laws in Russia. This should not have been, neither this nor that should not have been even addressed. There's no need to address that. No need to have a law. Look at all the regulations about how to enter the airport, how to get out, and all of these things are all this is both in, in the urban state, which emerged from absolute rule, and these are emerged from feudalism and from people believing they are sovereign on earth and they are, have divine power on earth, the divine rights of king, and developed now in the secular state and giving these divine rights back to the people, quote and unquote, all of these things. And obviously, this is impossible. So, in actually, the, the divine right of the um, people of power, the people of money, of Wall Street, etc., and the city of London of its financial power and its corruption. So, so that's that's historical here. Yeah? There in, in Islamic history, at least the state was not that deeply penetrating. Sure, in general, and they would not bother what happened in the society unless someone rebels or make excessive demand on the ruler, which the ruler is not interested to fulfill. So maybe that's the reason that it went, you could say, generally, general life for most Islam. But let us, for example, 
شيخ الخلافه العثمانيه in, in about 1500 plus around that the the printing press was invented actually the printing press is essentially the printing full page by gutenberg uh, it was actually uh, uh, previously invented in samarkand is gutenberg adopting that from samarkand or inventing independence that's irrelevant maybe he did it eventually and there's no problem with that who said that a german or or a or a black man or a white man or a blue-eyed man will not be able to invent. Everyone can invent, no problem. So we don't go with who is the first invention. This prohibition is prohibited. Question, is this prohibition supported by Islam? I would say this prohibition is prohibiting a mubah and actually a desirable mubah, which, which will give people the facility to read the books, to spread knowledge. Uh, is, will, will be will be in synchronization with Allah's command. Read, study. They with that undermine the people getting knowledge and spreading widely. So I would say that prohibition, which later on was strengthened to even death penalty, is a kufr law. No, for example, let me shock Shahid and Shaykh Hajib Tahrir, for example. So I don't know. I, his argument is all based on, on, on 240 premises. That his definition of Islamic government is wrong. It's not Islam. All these are not Islamic governments. Since Mahawiya, we have we have to give up on that. We have to face the bitter reality. That's it. Secondly, Sharia doesn't cover it. Cover everything. It surely it has covered, as we discussed at the previous. It covered it. Then the whole discussion become become mute. But the Hizb Tahrir is in a corner without any doubt. He has cornered Hizb Tahrir, but also he has exposed that the background he came from is. Uh, is uh, but who was admit actually interestingly i think in the first video he admitted that he when he based islam he thought about rebellion and things like that as it's a natural way some coming islam fresh then he was contaminated obviously by salafi and madkhali and classical scholars who contaminated his mind with the bs of uh, sorry to use such a language the bs of al-mawardi uh, and so on and al-aqd and these partly fabricated hadith or fully fabricated hadith that's what has happened his initial position was correct, but it was there was no way by putting the argument on the table the correct way. And then part of the correct way is to show what to do if you are ruled by cover and by oppressive regime. Is the rebellion the only way? Are there other avenues? What to do? And so on. That needs to be uh, uh, sorted out in, in something like Muhasab to Hukam. We have sorted out. It's not always the rebellion, it's something else. <clears throat> so so that's the problem. It's, it's, it's a twisted problem because it has been in, uh, either accidentally or deliberately twisted through Islamic history. Accidentally by, by simple-minded gullible scholars for history after Muawiyah and so on and colonies of the government or deliberately by treasonous uh, scholars. I should remind myself and remind you and remind Brother Shahid or, or the saying of Allah in the Quran Plenty of the scholars and the monks, they consume people wealth unjustifiably and misguide from the way of Allah. Obviously, this is what the Tawbah, Allah is addressing directly. The first target is the Ahbar and Rahban of the Jews and Christian. But who said this woman does not have Ahbar and Rahban? And plenty of them has also consumed the the wealth of the people and are justifyingly and also misguided from the way of Allah. And also we have the hadith narrated by, for, by uh, both Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aas and Uqba ibn Amr al-Juhani for the messenger of Allah, almost the same wording. Exactly, I think exactly the same wording. أكثر منافقي أمتي قراء The most munafiq of my ummah are not the common people, not the street sweeper, not the, one, the butcher in the corner, no. قراءها, the reader, the scholars. And that's a correct name, by the way. The word used ulama is wrong. Ulama is knowledgeable, is only uh, is only praised is only praised in the Quran. The correct translation of ulama, the people of knowledge, the knowledgeable. That's different than the people of scholarship, the reader, the ahbar, the people of ink. Ahbar comes from Hebr, and Hebr is the ink, the people of ink, the, the people who write, the people who write. These are not as praiseworthy. Because they may be they may have data and information, but they don't have knowledge. Because they don't have the they have a deep insight in the reality of the universe and the respect and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Mayaqsha Allah and the Badi Ulama. So don't trust these so called in, in popular jargon, ulama actually they are only qurra, they're only readers or scholars. They are not knowledgeable people. 
So this is also a faulty translation you find uh, used in, in some Quran translation that uh, the way the ulama is translated uh, in uh, as, as, as scholar. No, ulama is the knowledgeable people. And they're actually, if a Quran mentioned the people of scholarship, either use ahbar or use ahl al-dhikr, the people of remembrance or of study, the people of study, ahl al-dhikr. When he argued with the Qurayshi about when they said, uh, we, we don't accept a human messenger, he said, ask the people of previous books and previous revelation, whoever claimed to be prophet in the past, were the angels? They will tell you. All in history says that a, a human being out of flesh and blood who claimed to be messenger. We never sent any angel down as a messenger. That was that was an issue they could ask the people of scholarship, the people who have books and carry faith to history. That's it. So either Ahli Dhikr, people of Dhikr, of remembrance, of, of study, people of study, scholars, or Qurra. The Quran doesn't use the word Qurra, but use the command Iqra. And then when the message is ordered, Qurra be zidni ilm, increase me in knowledge, not in reading, not in. That's not relevant. What's relevant? Knowledge, real knowledge, which make you recognize your place in the universe and your relation to Allah, and then you become enlightened. You fear Allah. You respect Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Then you will not make such blunders. Just to yeah. just to just to just, that's just, just so uh, actually it is the same. It is going in the same grinding, the same same false premises. Islamic could be Islamic regime could be oppressive and so on. By the way, if if a regime. Uh, in act laws which by them is oppressive, this is an act of God, this is kufr bah. What does it mean kufr bah? For example, if, like, like I said, that the prohibition of the, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the printing press and even on the death penalty. I would say this is kufr bah. Well, you're putting a had on something that Allah and his messenger didn't put a had on. Hmm? So, you know, it, it would be different if it was less than 10 lashes, but to put a had on something like that, that's... You know, even the prohibition itself, uh -huh. the prohibition itself, even without any punishment. And in addition, making a death penalty for something was not punishable by death, but according to the fundamental principle of Islam, not is not haq. You cannot shed blood with a haq. Will the same also be applicable for people who are drug so This is a kufr law. The people who have possession of drugs and then they have death penalties in places, I don't know, maybe Indonesia or places. Uh, we, that's we can argue because some people say it's maybe this is like, like, like a public rebellion and so on. That is maybe a fine point to discuss. But in principle, if it is not argued that it is uh, it is muharaba, it is either either a rebellion by, by, by the sword, uh, uh, actual rebellion, or de jure rebellion, rejecting the law publicly and openly, like someone someone marrying marrying a dog or marrying a man publicly and bragging this is this is this is rebellion even if in not by the sword it is it is rebellion against the public order public that will be an act of kufr will be act of muharaba for example but this is fine points we're not going there but prohibiting the printing press is definitely not not, not having no sharia god whatever I'm continue with this recording now in a second so the other one is um so his his owners firstly is islamic oppressive just to put things in clear perspective by being oppressive you negate your claim towards islam you're effectively uh, according to the exactly. exactly according to the hadith i mentioned was narrated from thawban and from umhani and from Umani ibn bashir and from anas ibn ali from these four sahabi Okay. The other the one, imam, is, the imam are from Quraysh. They are legitimate imams as long as they, if they rule, they rule with justice. If they promise, they fulfill the promise. And if they are asked for mercy, they still him or him. Whoever does not do that, Allah cares, and the cares of the angel, the cares of all people on them. Uh, on them. But that's not all. There's no belief. There's okay. instruction to us. Then put your sword on your shoulder, exterminate them. But if you don't do that, you will become miserable selves. Like what we exactly what happened in history, we became miserable selves, slaves. <laughs> He's also put the premise, for example, improving the existing system. So, I mean, for example... Uh, we don't want to go on this fine point. Yeah. I think this I'm is the way to mandate these kind of things to say that they're legitimate and that's your job. And uh, What he advises with Tahir, that's another discussion. We have these fundamental then built on that, then the discussion and discourse will be what should have his Tahir and what should we as Tajdeen and other Islamic movements do. Okay, I'm going to just recording what, this part. Uh, what is that? What I let me just summarize from I just I think it will be a waste of time to discuss his suggestion in details because it's based on a false false promises. He says accept these regimes; they are somehow Islamic, and just try to improve. I say no, reject these regimes; say they're not Islamic, 
and tell the people that's the way of change according to Quran and Sunnah, which is not necessarily rebellion, but this has to be studied. That's in Muhasabat al Hakam that said, where is the constitutional court? Where is the justification? Ask a regime, give us, give us the justification for the giving giving permission to use the rebanking. And tell us if this is not riba or it is riba. If it's riba, why is permitted? What is the due risk? What is the necessity? Give us. You are accounted to us. Well, ultimately, we have the right. You claim we have you have bay'ah. All of them claim they have bay'ah or elect as a Muslim. But the Muslim have to be educated that if you have the majority and you have sufficient power as an ummah, not as an army, you have the right to ask and enforce. Because we are not obliged to establish a state. Establishing a state or establishing power is in the hand of Allah. This is the system of the universe. But we obliged, if we are established on it, الَّذِينَ إِنْ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَوا الزَّكَاةُ وَأَمَرُوا الْمَعْرُوفَ نَعْرُوا Allah said, if we establish them on earth, raising the believer, we establish them, Allah is the one establishing then they establish prayer, establish a system of prayer, and they collect zakat, and command good and forbid evil, meaning having political parties and doing, doing improvement of government continuously. So Allah knows that you are a failure. They have to be corrected continuously. And Surah Al-Asr, إِنَّ إِنْسَانَ فِي خُسْرٌ إِلَّا ذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَوَاصَوا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوا بِالصَّبْرِ All humans are at loss, except to who embrace faith and عمل الصريحة دو قديس وثلاث نوت إلى وتواصل بالحق أجونش إيش أذر with the truth أجونش إيش أذر with the perseverance of sabr oh, there's, a, there's a process in sort of interacting you have be dynamically continuously correcting the others as persons as organizations as companies and as, as a local administration as a, a local states and as, as federal entity you have to continuously admonish them and instructing them, and they have to admonish you and instruct you, and back and forth continuously. Otherwise, uh, corruption will spread because humans are corruptible. Professor, this is a good point, actually, because most of them, traditional scholars, they understand patience, that uh, you need to be patient towards the hukam. But no, uh, but the fact that uh, patience means that you need to struggle um, to, endure, to endure advise because... them and to endure uh, to, to endure to um, ask them to change and 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 and, 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 when, and when Allah said tawassab al sabr they admonish each other to be patient what is patience the scholars themselves when they come to the to the books of spirituality and akhlaq and riyadh al salihin they call the patience there are three types al sabr ala 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 fitna al mal that you have to endure the temptation of money and wealth that needs patience at sabr fi shadaid, you have to endure the hardship. Huh? And then sabr, you have to endure carrying the burden of, the, of, of prayer and zakah. But prayer is a burden, definitely. Some people who are really so devoted, it will become a pleasure, like a messenger of Allah. But most humans, it's very difficult to get at fajr time up. You have to do it. And the most difficult, we are stingy. We have difficulty getting, giving the zakat out. We have to force ourselves. So all these kind of patients, that was, uh, and, and I see you, I again, don't do that. Force yourself to pray at Fajr. Get up at Fajr. I sleep late. As a, no, try. I, I'm I working as a guard. Okay, then extend your time until you pray Fajr, then sleep until noon. Manage it. Re rearrange your time. Re try to get your life. That's meaning I admonish you with sabr and organize your life. And you admonish me or the other one. But not only person to person, but person to groups, person to, to government, etc. So patience is, is is not being submissive and uh, no no that's going not no, going no. to corner and not facing the that's contradicts the, the hadith we said from four of the sahaba which is clearly says if you don't do that fight these rulers which are extreme which worthy of fighting obviously that's the only case of they are forward then you will be served miserable self okay. just eat. I, yes yes I'm, I'm conscious surviving, of the time. Wanna... on food that's it okay you have no, human dignity and you have standing. I'm going to continue with this because uh, um, the next video you may find very contentious, but inshallah, let me just finish the, this bit. If there's anything further to add, whether or not in actual legal definition, whether or not the governments that we have are or are not Islamic, because of course the Islamists will say any government that we ourselves in our party is not running is by definition un-Islamic. You know, any government that is imperfect, any government that has oppression, any government that has injustice, any government that has corruption, is by definition un-Islamic. No, that's not true by the legal definition. 
If that was true, then that would then you would have to concede that we have not had any form of Islamic government since the uh, abdication of Hassan bin Ali, because we have always had, with rare periods of exception, we have always had corruption, we have always had injustice, we have always had oppression. I mean, the number of just, fair... Good that he admits that, that anyway. ...has a number for the 100 years. Um, Rush, we addressed that, I think. We, we can't skip the rest. It's mostly like reinforcing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just go I mean, there. I just want to squeeze, because there are some other bits. Just, just, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll create a speech, just so that we can get through it. Mm -hmm. In case there's anything missed that. I mean, how can you explain, for example, all of the, almost, you know, almost down the list of the most eminent scholars in Islamic history were in prison. That was under Islamic government. Any government, in order for it to be righteous, or to be more righteous, to be less unjust, to be less oppressive, that's going to take a continuous struggle. And a continuous effort on the part of the people, as has always been the case in Islamic history. Your real role is not to try to seize power. Your real role is not to try to take down a government. Your real role is where it has always been, which is to speak truth to power and to try, through practical ways, within your sphere of influence, to make things better, to make things more fair, to make things more just, to make things less corrupt. Because that's what we all really need when you talk about Islamic government. It means what, we, what we all generally actually need is we want governments that are better, we want governments that are, that are fairer, we want governments that treat their people more decently. And another key point that, that most people mean when they talk about Islamic government, we want independence. We want to actually have sovereignty. We want to actually be able to make the decisions for our own society. So if you want to be useful, then you have to pick one of the exact things that are, that, you know, as you see them, contradictory to Islam. Prove that they are contradictory to Islam, either to the Sharia itself, or that they contradict you know, fundamental Islamic values. Find those the, the, the things that are undermining those principles and those values, and work to change those things. And whatever your government is, whatever form your government takes. There is no statement from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that said that you have to establish the Khilafah. Even when he used the word Khilafah, it was not in reference to a political system that was articulated and organized and defined. When Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam referred to Khilafah, he was referring to the linguistic meaning of the word, meaning just whatever system of authority, whatever system of government, whatever system of rule came after him. Only later did we start to call, you know, transform the word Khilafah from its linguistic meaning into a political term, because there is no political system. There are specific rules, and any system that either does implement those rules or aspires, genuinely, sincerely aspires, to or, or articulate its commitment to implement those rules is an Islamic system. So you have to be adaptable and you have to be realistic and do what the righteous believers have always done throughout all of Islamic history, which is to just struggle to try to make things better. Okay, so in here, just to, just to summarize, it's basically improve the existing system. Um, okay. that's, that's, that's another issue. I, I don't think it is. It's based on that. They said that Every Islam is basically that from from uh, from uh, uh, the abdication of Al Hassan until now he's right. Is not I say all he claimed they are Islamic. I say they are not Islamic. That's it. Uh, what what would you would have been is is uh, uh, someone may argue and study history. The people of Harad regarded their duty to fight against Yazid. The after uh, uh, the uh, uh, because of many things, including what happened with Hussein, etc. And other many other things. Uh, the people of Jamajim, they regarded their uh, uh, duty is to fight against uh, against Abdul Malik ibn Muran and his uh, his Hajjaj, and uh, his claim that these Islamic governments is, is actually faulty. So the whole thing needs to be studied from the ground up in a, a different way. That history went the wrong way, and went into diversion. Yes, it's true, and the diversion because these Munafiq Kafir jumped on the power and they were able to mislead the Ummah by all kinds of nifaq and playing tricks and games. But generally, the general Ummah and the general judiciary, etc., was okay. But is, is it strictly formally the proper Islamic ruling which was established by the Messenger of Allah and the Khulafa Rashidin? Definitely, it's not. <clears throat> the, the, did, did some kufr wah there? I would say there have been kufr wah. If we analyze history correctly, we'll find clear kufr wah committed by some of the rulers. Play the last one. This is a slightly longer one. Uh, we can skip through as need be, but there's. There's a general thread in this next one, which is about kind of exonerating a lot of this. So it gets pretty bad. Uh, to be honest with you, I mean, some of the stuff of, of giving Husna Zan to some of these scumbag rulers. But anyway, I'll say yeah. that Mohammed bin Salman and the UAE governments, many Muslims regard as illegitimate. What do you say about the fact that some people have called you an agent or an apologist for the Arab regimes? <clears throat> a little bit difficult. Uh, for me to be an agent, considering the fact that I'm banned for life from the GCC. I wonder if that's true for any of the people who are criticizing my stance, for people who are accusing me. I can't go to Dubai. I can't go to the Khalid. I can't go to the Gulf. I have a lifetime ban ever since my case, and I haven't done anything since I got out of prison uh, to make the Gulf rulers like me anymore. 
In fact, I'm sure that sometimes they wish they would have executed me when they had the chance. I wouldn't be surprised if the U.S. wishes that they had done that as well. This is one of the most amusing accusations that I've ever gotten, actually, and I've gotten all the accusations. Whenever someone labels you something, uh, online especially, what they're really doing is just announcing that they are the opposite of what they called you. You know, They're announcing that they belong to the opposite camp. They're telling you what vantage point uh, they're seeing you from, or the filter through which they're seeing you. So sometimes I've been called a Marxist, uh, a leftist, and sometimes I'm called a capitalist. Sometimes I'm called a Khadiji, and sometimes I'm called a Methali. Sometimes I'm called a Wahhabi, sometimes I'm called an Ikhwani. None of this has anything to do most of the time with uh, what I am or what I'm saying or what my ideas are. It just has nothing to do really with the ideological box that the person themselves is in and their need uh, to make sure that everyone else is also in some kind of easily identifiable box the same way that they are. I mean, there's some people who think I'm not even a real person. They think I'm some sort of AI, which would be a stunning revelation for my wife and children. There's nothing new, by the way. This is something I've been dealing with for years, which I suppose is the same for anyone who's ever opened their mouth in public. But as far as the Arab regimes go, especially in the Gulf states, I doubt that any of the people who are criticizing me for my stance uh, towards the UAE, for example, I doubt that they have more reason than I do uh, to be anti-UAE. For most of these critics, uh, the wrongdoing and injustice of the Arab regimes <clears throat> is an abstraction, not for me. I was tortured in the UAE. I was beaten with clubs and truncheons. I was electrocuted. I was stripped and waterboarded in the UAE. Friends of mine were executed by firing squad in the United Arab Emirates, and they were innocent men. I went through seven years uh, of a farcical court process in which I could not testify. I could not defend myself. I couldn't meet with an attorney. Uh, it was a complete sham. My original appeals court trial, if you can believe it, lasted for exactly two sessions, one in which I pled innocent uh, and the other in which I was uh, found guilty and sentenced to death without any testimony of any kind. The UAE published in their state-controlled media some of the most horrific, slanderous lies and sensationalistic stories about me. And this is something that uh, the uh, UAE authorities told me they were going to do when they were interrogating me. Ever since I got out of prison, uh, I worked with Detained in Dubai and Due Process International, which are the two leading organizations in the world that have supported thousands of people who have been wrongfully detained and falsely accused in the UAE. I know the details of literally thousands of cases of wrongdoing by the UAE government, by the Saudi government, by the Qatari government, and throughout the Gulf. If anyone has a reason uh, to bear a grudge against these regimes, it's me. But as a Muslim, I have to put my personal feelings aside, and I have to try to be fair. I have to try to be objective. A Muslim has to tell the truth, even if it's bitter. And we have to be honest, even uh, about people whom we may despise. And we have to try to understand situations beyond our own personal experience. And we have to understand how our own personal experience may make us biased. No matter how much you might dislike someone, you never have the right to lie about them. Look, you know, there's a, a very prevalent and very counterproductive sentiment uh, amongst our people. And it is directly opposed uh, to what the religion teaches us. And that is this idea uh, that somehow hating the rulers is a sign of piety, a sign of righteousness. If you don't hate the rulers, you can't be a good person, you can't be a good Muslim, and you can't love Islam. Like it's a pillar of faith. Uh, to delegitimize and hate the rulers. This is incredibly ignorant and unfair. And like I said, it's counterproductive and it's self-destructive. What kind of a default position is that? And who do you think benefits from that being the default position? Whose interests are served by having the Muslims all hate their rulers? It certainly isn't the interest of the Muslims. The imam, the leader, the ruler, uh, is guiding the affairs of his community, whether you like it or not. He's guiding the affairs of his community, his state, his people. And Rasulullah said that he is a shield for the Muslims. So how are you going to hate him? Just because he isn't perfect. Just because he commits sins. Just because he does wrong sometimes. Don't you? Is your default position to hate every Muslim who's just like you? And who follows Islam and adheres to the Sharia imperfectly, just like you follow Islam and adhere to the Sharia imperfectly. And you know they'll say that uh, they hate the rulers because they don't rule by what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed. Well, they do it as much as you do it, as much as you do in your own life. You do it as much as they do, which is to the best of your ability. And you fail, and they fail sometimes. You compromise sometimes, and they compromise sometimes. You succumb to pressure sometimes, and so do they. And you can't imagine the types of pressures that they're under. You can't imagine the stakes that they're grappling with. I mean, heavy is the head that wears the crown. That's a fact. But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. That the best of your rulers are those whom you love and they love you. And the worst of your rulers are those whom you hate and they hate you. The order of the wording is important, in my opinion. Your love and your hate come first. They don't love or hate you first. Theirs is a reaction to however you are towards them. Now, that doesn't mean being uncritical. But be fair in your criticism. Be balanced. If the rulers do something that you think is wrong, just say this thing is wrong. Don't say the ruler is evil. The ruler is an apostate. The ruler is a puppet of the West. The ruler is a devil. That's just creating fertile ground uh, for your enemies to sow hostility and chaos in your society and to keep your nation from ever moving forward or unifying behind its leadership. Because look, everything that happened to me in the UAE, uh, whatever abuse, uh, whatever wrongdoing that I suffered at the hands of the authorities in the United Arab Emirates, all of those things happen in the West. Police brutality is just as bad in the West as it is anywhere else in the world, if not worse. People are beaten in the West. People are tortured in the West. People are railroaded through sham trials. Innocent people go to jail. Innocent people get executed. But there's khair in the UAE. There's goodness in the UAE and in the Arab and the Muslim world that they don't have in the West. Thousands of people every year get pardoned from prison in the UAE and in the Arab world, throughout the Muslim world. Their debts get paid off. Yes, there are system failures, but many times the system works. I mean, I'm here today because the system ultimately worked in my case. I have no hard feelings towards the UAE, despite being intimately familiar with the flaws in their system. And from the lowliest uh, prison guard to the warden, uh, from the police to the prosecutors to the judges, I can tell you, that every one of them cares about Islam as much as any other Muslim does. And just like any other Muslim, they fall short sometimes. And that's no reason to hate someone.
That's no reason to hate them. That's no reason to hate their system. That's no reason to hate their governments. Both the UAE and Saudi Arabia, and Qatar as well, uh, have governed their states remarkably well. The leaders of those countries are some of the brightest, uh, most strategic and visionary leaders in the world today. And I'm saying that while they won't even let me put one foot inside of their countries. I'm saying it because it's true. I'll say it even if I have to say it begrudgingly. I can't lie about that. You know, everyone likes to say that these leaders uh, in the Gulf, in the Arab countries, that they're puppets of the West, puppets of the United States. But again, because of the type of work that I do, I'm thoroughly familiar with the kind of influence that these countries have in the West. It's an outdated, obsolete way of thinking to say that uh, they're anyone's puppets. They are tactfully and strategically uh, navigating the power dynamics in their region, and they're doing it masterfully. And they're building, like I've said before, a sort of soft empire across the Middle East and Africa and beyond. And future generations of Muslims will inherit and benefit from all of that for at least a century or more. Now, yes, in some cases, they are building that soft empire ruthlessly. They're doing it violently in some cases. It includes subjugation. I think that the Gulf states, uh, for example, have recognized that the International Monetary Fund uh, is a tool for conquest, and they're actually working in conjunction with the IMF uh, in places like Egypt and in Tunisia, so that instead of Western multinationals and investors conquering those countries, they can conquer those countries. Once the IMF reforms make those countries more vulnerable to conquest, they're going to be the ones to do it. Look, this is the real world. Like I've said many times, if you are a weaker nation, if you are uh, a vulnerable economy, independence is not an option for you. If the West doesn't take over, someone else will. It will either be China or Russia or else the West will just destabilize your country to the point of catastrophic chaos. And you'll never be able to advance. You'll never be able to develop in any way whatsoever. But the Gulf states are moving in, uh, sometimes acting as brokers or as managers for uh, the interests of the West, for the interests of China, for the interests of Russia. But in actuality, uh, in my opinion, they're moving in to lay the groundwork for their own authority, to bring these countries uh, under their own sphere of influence. And that, whether you realize it or not, holds major predatory powers at bay. It's a brilliant strategy. They're creating something like a buffer zone between the West and the Western-oriented owners and controllers of global financialized capital and the Muslim world. They're creating a buffer zone between the OCGFC uh, and the global South to some extent, between the OCGFC and the Muslim world. And whether you're intelligent enough, and whether you're dispassionate enough, and whether you're objective enough to see it or not, they are even integrating Israel into their sphere of influence. That is the most historic and monumental strategic victory that you can imagine. Look, normalization is the beginning of the end of Zionism. There's no two ways about it. Israel was a project that only made strategic sense for the West in the context of the 20th century global order, and it doesn't make sense anymore, and Israel knows it. That's why hardline Zionists like Netanyahu are losing their minds today, because they know the party's over. The umbilical cord between Tel Aviv and Washington is going to get cut, and Israel is going to have to integrate properly into the region, into the outer region, into the Muslim world, into the Middle East, if they want to survive in any way whatsoever, and they know it, and the Gulf leaders know it. And they know, the Jews know, that the only people in history who ever dealt with them fairly were the Muslims. Believe me, it won't be long uh, before you stop hearing phrases like uh, Judeo-Christian, and you start hearing about how the Jews enjoyed their golden age during the Islamic empire. Look, you don't survive uh, as a cohesive community for thousands of years without knowing which side your bread is buttered on. So no, I'm not an apologist, I'm a realist, and I want to see the Muslims achieve economic sovereignty, political independence, and psychological decolonization. And I see that these rulers, these governments, uh, are making practical and strategic moves that benefit those objectives. And if they're not personally the most righteous and pious people, okay, well, neither am I. But what they're building uh, might yet be inherited by leaders who are more pious and who are more righteous than they are. I mean, Nuruddin Zengi was better than his father, but it's because of what his father did. He inherited what his father had built, and that's what made him able to do what he did, and subsequently what Salahuddin Ayyubi was able to do. That's how power works. That's how empires work. There are story told across history, and we inhabit just one very small moment in that story. So for me, uh, I see any people who are excessively critical uh, or who excessively denigrate the rulers in the Muslim world, I see those people as propagandists for our enemies. And most of the criticism that they offer reeks of propaganda. It's always riddled with uh, distortions, with half-truths, with exaggerations, with hyperbole and emotion. And it sells the cheapest kind uh, of self-righteousness, the kind that relies on uh, defaming the character of others to try to make yourself uh, seem better than them by implication. Like, oh, Mohammed bin Salman did such and such, and I'm just aghast at the impiety of it all, which is just a passive way of advertising your implied piety. It's what I would call taqwa signaling, you know, like virtue signaling. It's like when someone uh, offers particularly pedantic nasiha just to show how righteous they are. It's self-serving and unhelpful. So whoever the ruler is, in my opinion, uh, whoever your ruler is, wherever you are in the Muslim world, you should pray for him and you should hope for the best from him and don't help shaitan against him and don't help the enemies of the Muslims against him. 
And in fact, this goes for everyone else, for all your brothers and sisters in Islam. Be balanced in your criticism. Be fair and limit your criticism uh, to their particular actions that are objectionable and don't attack their character. You know, we all know and believe, and we've all seen uh, that people can start good and turn bad. And we're always quick to gossip about those people and condemn them for that. But it's just as possible for people to start bad and turn good. That's just as possible. Now, when someone goes from good to bad, we tend to disregard whatever good they ever did before that. But when a bad person turns good, we won't let them forget how they used to be. And we forever suspect that their goodness is fake. This is wrong. Everyone is struggling between their own goodness and their own evil. And there's evil in a good person and there's good in an evil person. None of us, or anyway, very few of us, are actually 100% one or the other. And that includes the rulers. Sorry, before you say anything, uh, I'm surprised my stomach could take all of that because honestly, I haven't... I can't think of anything more politically naive. Yeah, yeah. It's it's ridiculous. This, man, I mean, honestly, for example, like, for example. The, uh, but you, not only political naive, it's ideological naive, because he, his starting point is that uh, really is the, is the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the fortification of classical scholars, al-halu, al-aqd, all of this rubbish, that human beings are, being, are failing. Yes, they are failing. There is there's an accounting system to the government. There's, there's a strict ruling system. There's a strict rule. There must be a court system. For example, if these are really care about Islam, let's say this regime, why there is there's an independent, strong judiciary which can tell the ruler stop there? It used to be in time past. Even the Young Khalif Uthmaniyah, there's something like that over there. A, a, a judge could, could judge against the Khalifa and Khalifa have, have to, to submit. That's have even abolished. We don't have that. It's not formalized in their constitution. They don't have constitutional court. They don't have all of these things, which they, they will be enshrining this ayah. They should have been the first one to have that, not America and not Germany, or the constitutional court, etc. Uh, the, the, uh, the problem is that the, 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 the philosophical and the Sharia background in his mind is very, relatively weak and poor and have this misunderstanding of this myth, obedience and so on. And, and this trust to the, as I said, because these hadith which have been hidden and the correct understanding of the Quran, but, but let me stress again, don't obey does not mean you rebel. There's in between stages. One of this is civil disobedience. That's, that's the most important stage, which is also enshrined in the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, which Ahmed Muhammad called a bad hadith. Huh? And all that his son to strike it out of the Muslim, but still in Bukhari and Muslim, Alhamdulillah. Etc. So the naivety is coming from the you see how how your view of the of the halal and haram view of good and evil can can make your analysis of the reality twisted. But Sheikh, one yes. thing I just one thing I just don't get. Look, to give us to these people they're doing an amazing job. Like they, they make make mistakes. Like for example, you don't judge, but Sheikh, the most I'll probably do when I was younger, maybe steal some sweets. That's not the same as carpet bombing Yemen. You know, there's no equivalent. The, the political naivety is that of a power. Yeah, yeah I, I understand, but, but, but from the problem is is, is that. That's, you started from that point. You started from the definition of Korwah. He must process completely. He must come say, I don't believe in Allah. Your Allah is this and this, or something like that. That's the only Korwah for him. But even, even take Erdogan. Take Erdogan, for example. Say Erdogan, we give him benefit of the doubt. He's gone from a overtly secular place to introducing certain things. I can see a person giving some kind of pass. Compare that to some like MBS. I mean, just compare the history. Well, uh, uh, clearly, uh, clearly, his, uh, clearly uh, 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 his problem is like, that's the, uh, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt in the sense that his starting point, the ideological or the, or the Sharia point or, or the Islamic point of view is fundamentally faulty. That's the reason his analysis of the reality is faulty. Let's get bigger. Yeah, even a secular person would make such a ridiculous. Even, even yeah. for example, look, look at for example Al Quds uh, Al Arabi. Uh, he, the, I forgot the brother's name. He wasn't overtly an Islamist, but he had. I, I tell you how, why he this fell in that. I tell you, I tell you why he fell in that trap. Most likely, he's interacting with Madhali and so on. And their usual argument is that rebellion will lead to upheaval, and these rulers are under. And the duress, and that's what they tell them in in private meeting. In private, meeting, they tell them we have to do that. We have to sneak in between, etc. Otherwise, they will come and take the country and open brothels and open this and that. So we have to do the minimum and work around. And we cannot say publicly anything. And we play, have to play the game. And the Madhari tell their follower this thing. They are doing their best. They are really fundamentally Muslims. They have their shortcomings. They they come with zina. They drink hummer. All of us do that. That's not a problem. And so on. 
that's I think he has infected has infected by this idea. I wouldn't be surprised if he if he tell if he tell uh, 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 come and tell us that uh, 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 NBC is carpet bo 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 bombing Yemen uh, essentially because he thinks that Houthi will undermine Saudi Arabia and undermine Islam. He that he may argue in his favor like that. He's mistaken, but he may argue in his favor like that because he would try to find anything to get him out of, uh, out of the trouble. Also, such a theory is pleasing for yourself because this way you feel obliged, you are doing the best, you are praying for them, you are doing, you are, you are intending the best for the Ummah and hoping that maybe the next uh, king or the next ruler will be better. And the next, if the next bad, then the one after next until Yawm al -Qiyamah. That's the way it has been happened since the time of Arab. You say the one after them may be better. The one after them may be better. Don't rebel. Try to give some nasiha. Try to do it secretly. Try to do that. That's the trap. And this you know, trap... That, you know that is you know what when a wife gets beaten after she calls the ambulance for the 15th time, my husband's a good man, he ain't gonna do that again. And then he does it again. Even a donkey would know better than that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, but that's the problem. That, that, I mean, honestly, that is that is this 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 video really did make me cringe. It's like, even in terms of Israel, that you know, uh, a wife means that for example, Indian wives and uh, subcontinental wives who have been educated that that the husband is like a god on earth, that's number one. Or that's a Muslim, don't say that explicitly like that, but it's almost close like that, and you touch his feet, and uh, or, 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 the, or, uh, or the, the Muslim uh, side may believe in the fabricated hadith that he is your paradise, uh, he is either your paradise or hellfire, so he's the distinguisher. So your hellfire is your husband. If you obey him, you enter in paradise. If you, So then you will be, if you indoctrinate this way, that's a best fabricate or, uh, or something like that. You will be, even he'll be, if you are beaten 15 times, he said, He's my paradise. I have to obey. It's, the point of view about the universe and what gets you to uh, paradise or hellfire is that what will motivate you to analyze the reality. But, but sir, a professor, even more severe, uh, severe fallacy. As the man is uh, starting looking at the reality in the, in the false light. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I would also like to add that there is a, a, an even severe um, fallacy in his talk. Maybe it's been sneak, sneaked to the to those naive Muslims by, as you said, the Madkhalis. You yeah. know, they say that if you if, if you go out to confront the rulers, you will cause a bloodshed. And as, as the brother said, it will be a catastrophic and disastrous. Like, look at what happened to Syria and Egypt. So in their subconscious, Professor, they are saying that they are already admitting that if you go to confront the ruler, he will he, he would kill you. So he they are subconsciously admitting that the ruler. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, of it's your a, bloodshed. It's a, you a, it is a circular argument, but the problem only way to get out of that is to see if the revelation has specified anything like that and see what is the water, what's the fundamental principles. Not some one hadith here and there, some hadith. hadith. Put all of them together. And that's what we did partly in Hasrat al-Hukam, the old version, and we'll prove in it. So his problem is that, not that he is not a Muslim or he's not sincere, or he's agent of the Gulf countries. If he used this language, that's a mistake. The Hizb is having this disease, this is an agent, Bin Laden is an agent, September 11th, the American plot, all these things. These things, that the Hizb shot itself and put that as it is from the rest of the Ummah because of that. But that's explain, that's makes, explain these things, like for example, why uh, the, the Hobbesian point of view that the rebellion is bad and so on? Because the civil war after uh, uh, and, and the, the bloodshed which has happened by, uh, by, by, before Cromwell and all Cromwell, after Cromwell, after that, he, he came with the theory that rebellion, rebellion against the king should be obeyed. Nobody should, at least should, nobody should rebel, which, because the king is either obedience or rebellion. There's no other thing. Unless he, even if he kills half of the people, and even if he changes the religion of the people, he said that clearly explained it. That's the Hobbesian point of view. So that's because he saw experience as something, uh, uh, let us say, uh, something traumatic. They, they did use the moral judgment based on a trauma of a certain historic event. That's what they deduced from. That's the problem. Not what is being, what's good and evil, uh, referring to a frame which is above, the, uh, above human feeling and above the physical reality. We have that in Quran and Sunnah Mutawatira. That's what the benefit of Quran and Sunnah. The English hopes and, and the European do not have that. 
They have to show you history and learn from history and make their analysis here, analysis there, and so on. The reactive history is that enduring such bad rulers will never improve things. It will deteriorate most of the time. It will deteriorate even, they may develop, sometimes it happens because in the Muslim world because the, the background of the people and the background of the nation, the background of history and the background of the location is supportive that they may develop some science. Emirates is developing science and technology quite advanced. That will benefit the Ummah. Does not mean they are not fragile. That, 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 but then we have also something which clarify that. The Messenger Allah said about, about a man who fought in Badr and killed so many mushrikeen, and he's a kafir. In Allah, the answer the deen, but regular al fajr. Allah support the religion with a fajr man. Does not mean that you accept his fujur or you don't say he's a fajr. You recognize the reality in this situation. Maybe I should abstain from rebellion because there's sufficient technology and development. But does not mean that say there's a good regime and it should be tolerated. It should be changed, should work in changing it. So he, that's the problem is his, his philosophical and the uh, Islamic background is not well balanced. It's lopsided. When he embraced Islam, he came from like fitra, revolutionary point of view, which Islam is really a revolution. Then the Madhali and Sunni spoiled him by this, this pseudo argument and this fabricated hadith, which believes from Messenger of Allah, it must come from Wahi. In reality, they are mostly fabricated or some words have been twisted and taken out of context which need really thorough analysis. And then the scholars in time past, unfortunately, let us down with their halwa uh, al-aqad, all these fabrications and these imaginary constructions. You see the point? So I'm not trying to find an excuse for him, but just expect that to happen to meet with many people. You have to dig deeper. That's the reason I say, we have to go to the deep points. We have to go to Muhasib al Hakam. We have to, and that's the reason, for example, the, the book about Sultan Ummah, the authority of the Ummah, is not yet out because it stands out. There's so many components there which need to be so thoroughly studied and analyzed until we have a crisp and clear idea. It's not that the authority of the Ummah, absolute, and all other theories of Al Hal al Aqd and the Ulat al Faqih, the Kufr system, you know that, and also the, the divine appointment of the Imam. Although I cannot call it a kufr because there's some shubha there, but it is definitely not Islamic. The only thing is shura, definitely. That's the one which established with certitude. And I, I, I would argue it's the only system which is established by Islam certitude. Another system is not acceptable. And based on that, we can develop what to do if things are violated and how to do and how to manage. That historic att attempts to correct the situation were mistaken, we did not done properly because of human failing or because of... Uh, Let's take this out, for example. One man who was participating in fighting with Hussein and killing him. Someone told him, did you participate in fighting with Hussein? The grandson of the Prophet said, we have to obey our rulers' command. If we don't obey our rulers, we'll be worse than the donkeys. That's his belief. That's his belief. That's how he was indoctrinated in the, in the time of, of Muawiyah. That's what Muawiyah did and his, his cronies. Fill the people's mind with this rubbish, with this, with, with, with this filth. So you have to clean people's mind and give them, but, but with giving, giving them the, the correct understanding, which understood, unfortunately was not given by Hizb al-Tahri, because Hizb al-Tahri claiming Khilafah was, was either, oh, the claim was the Khilafah was sort of wrong. No, Khilafah is, if, if you are established on earth and you have sufficient power, you are a majority in a country, you are not allowed to be ruled by Kufr. You should rule by Allah. That's your obligation as an Ummah. If you fail, you'll be accounted the Ummah Qiyam. If you do that, then you have established system which, if it is done as Allah said, establish prayer and system of salah, timing, etc., etc., as we discussed many times in tafsir. Zakah and command good and forbid you and that have the notice what the ayah said. Aqamu salata wa atu zakat wa amaru bil ma'rufin. Amaru bil ma'rufin meaning establishing parties and counting the government, continuous accounting. Otherwise, the establishment will disappear and the system will go into corruption. But this is, has not been understood and prior, has not understood by Hizb al-Tahrim. And this brother did not understand it also. Because all what he has in front of him, he came to Islam, is, uh, is obviously a based, uh, based on conviction. Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, no doubt of that, evidence of that over, overwhelming, fine. But what is the rest about the political system is the rubbish that we have through history. Al-Mawardi and so on, al al aqd and this nonsense. And that... Uh, Muawiyah, uh, since, since uh, uh, he recognized correctly that the, the proper system was until the abdication of Hazrat. And that after that, it's not a proper system. He's right in that. But he's trying to say it's Islamic and the people should have submitted.
to get out of the dilemma. Instead of being, uh, let me mention a nice story. I once, some people heard when I was still in Saudi Arabia that said, said about Al Saud, they are kafara al Fajara. Kafara, Fajara. So they visited me. One of them is a muhaddith, a good man. And I said, we hear that and we object to that severely. Uh, what, what? Uh, after a long discussion and so on, I mentioned the Rizari banking, I mentioned various things. And they said, anyway, we believe that this system is similar to the system of Muawiyah. I said, okay, so what's your conclusion? It's an Islamic system. I said, no, that's not a correct conclusion. Correct conclusion is that Muawiyah system is a kufr system. <laughs> Simple. You have to be consistent. You have to have set rules. But establish the rules which are with certitude, not based on the desire or based on 40 ahadith or, or some, uh, some scholarly blunders. That's, that's the problem. So that, I think that's, the, that, that's the, our job in Tajdeed. We should go to the fundamentals and clean them. And that's the reason we have this stress again. We have to go to the usul in the book of Tawheed. We have to get muhasab to al-hakam, accounting the rulers translated. We have to get the hakimiyah translated also as soon as possible. I think it's being translated, uh, yeah, etc. We have to get that. Hakimi has done, Muhasim al Khan was, was paused because you wanted to do some additional edits. We have, to, we have to review it because I think that there's, there's uh, all the developments over the last 20 years have, have brought and also scholarly uh, contributions and discussion and so on has, has added various things in that area. Uh, we should, uh, we but Professor, I, I would just like to pose a question for those uh, type of people, just to undermine their way of thinking, and inshallah, it will lead them to to think straight in the future and will lead them to the to the right path. Now, the brother here he said he mentioned uh, quite a few countries, mentioned Pakistan, Egypt, and uh, Turkey, for example, as a, as a functioning political regimes. But the brother here he did not he did not tell us the the trick. Is that, for example, when he said Egypt and that Ahl al Halwa al Aqd, they promoted uh, Sisi. So, why haven't Ahl al Halwa al Aqd, for example, in Egypt obeyed the previous uh, ruler based on your, based on your, uh, based on he, your. He, he, he will be stuck, he will be stuck. But what he answered, what he said is that. So, so, it will go, so it will go endlessly in chains. Actually, no, no, actually, he admitted that he said that he mentioned the four countries, they have elections, they have parliament and so on. So there's some kind of bay is there. But he said, and there's some how functions there. So the, although Pakistan and Egypt are not functioning properly. So he's admitting that. But 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 he but he made the uh, the, the the election of Al Sisi legitimate based on uh, the based on the choose of Ahl Al Hal Wal Abd, which is an image uh, an Im um, uh, imaginary um, uh, construct. No, 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 no. The problem is well, no, 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 he's guitar, you know. It was he's, he's, con he's con no, no, he's consistent because he said in Pakistan Ahl Al Abd is the army. Essentially, he's saying the same for Egypt. So even the election of Morsi with the majority of the Egyptian people, they are rubbish. They are zero. They are nil. Oh, sir. But my question to him, why haven't the Ahl al-Hal wal aqd which is he is uh, legitimizing, why they haven't already uh, obeyed the, the, the previous ruler? Why they because, because, the because no, why no, 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 Abu Mahab, he, he's consistent. The previous ruler was elected by the public to 52% of the people. These 50 sources are rubbish. They are not al 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 They are nil. The yeah, that's, is the yeah. one. That's what he sub subconsciously... Essentially, he has to say that. He has to, yes. Hey, look, the, 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 we can pick apart quite a bit of... So, for example, ultimately what that, they... That's the meaning of it. Is the mentality whereby... If, if CC is legitimate because... Uh, 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 say why the army did not prevent because the army that was under squeeze that did not want widespread bloodshed so they allowed the election waiting for the opportunity to kick everyone in the butt and they did they are the according to irony is if he's a political analysis he will be able to have figured out that Saul no, no no he's not a political analyst because what I'm saying what I'm saying if this is the one thing he's doing it's not very good because anyone would know that Egypt's a deep state and that their army themselves own something like 40% of infrastructure, even poultry, they own 40% of poultry. And they were the ones who stood down on all the infrastructure to effectively force out uh, uh, Morsi, uh, him a lot, and then they, uh, Al Saud, you know, um, gave them money. No, I'm, I'm not talking about that. The, reality, the reality is clear, no doubt, but I say, according to his philosophy, the Egyptian army, before and after they are had al 
52% of Egyptian water are rubbish. They are zero. They are irrelevant. Since the ayah of the Quran, Amr and Shura Bainam, is violated. And he doesn't care about that. He doesn't see the contradiction because he's never not, been advanced. Because, because, he's, because he's relying on Mawardi and so on, this imaginary construction, which they try to substitute for Shura and Bayah. That shows how, how this fails now. Now we have a democratic election, which is a reasonable way of expressing Bayah. Definitely is expressing Bayah. But that one is, 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 has not been accepted. The so called Al Halwa Al Aqd violated that. So they are tyrant and they are rebellious against the Ummah. Even if they are right, if they are power wise, they are Al Hal Aqd. Yes, they can smash your head. Yes. So he's, he's see, essentially what he's saying is might is the right. That's what he's saying. And that is fundamentally, so, so just to reiterate, it's fundam fundamentally cover. That's essentially what Ahmed Muhammad said. Whoever uh, 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 take power by the sword so that everyone accept him and submit to him, then it is not permissible for any Muslim except to accept him and submit him and regard him as Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he wanted to be this way to establish that Muawiyah is the legitimate one. The disease is very old, yeah, uh, uh, Shabab. It's very old. And it needs to be destroyed, yeah. Need to be, to be done from the root. So we don't discuss him the current situation and his dream world, and he hopes that the Muslim world prosper and advances. It's true, he has good hope. I believe he firmly wants the Muslim world to prosper. Except for this, that uh, normalizing Israel. Do you think Israel thinking. Oh, he thinks that that's how do he thinks that. That's, he I, thinks. I mean, but they, that is, that is pretty. I mean, they've been, they've been looking for normalization. Do you think they've been doing all these background negotiations with everyone for decades? And he not, th not, he not, thinks not, that. do. You see, you hear his analysis. He thinks this Israel is an imperial project of the 19th century. It is used this now. The best thing is to normalize with them and they will disappear automatically. He's living in a dream world. He looks at reality differently because his analysis of good and evil and right and wrong and halal and haram is not well, well, well formed. That's the problem. Influenced by classical scholars who failed us. That's it. Not because he's a failure or he has bad intention. No. Not because he's an agent like Hizb Tahrir may have uh, called him. No. It's clearly not. He was in prison, as he said. I don't think he's dying. And he maybe has electrocuted. Maybe suffered more than what we suffered. But it does not mean that you suffer that you, <laughs> that, that you are seeing the reality correctly. Like many people suffered in Egyptian prison and became radical opposite. They carried everyone to be a Catholic. You could have go to the one extreme and to the other extreme. No, no. They have the best intention. They have human feeling like I, the same way I have a human feeling. You can go to that extreme of gullibility or to the extreme of declaring everyone to be a Catholic. Find the, the reasonable objective based on your point of view of the world because what's meaning objective? You look at the reality through your own eyeglasses. There's no way. You have to. Only Allah SWT looks see the reality as it is because he's the one who created it. He's absolute. Any finite, limited being will look through his own glasses. There's no way. But the revelation of Quran Sunnah gives us glasses which we use. We, he cannot use it because it's offered to him in a mutilated way. And I think he's, qualified, he's not qualified to dig deep like that. And if he has dug deep, he faced this problem, faced a conflict, showed a few hadith, and this fit his nature. See, his nature seemed to be more toward the gullible side, toward the kind side, which is fine, no problem. Some people like that by nature. Some people like that by nature. I think that's it. I'm not, I'm not going to indulge in psycho psychoanalysis. I think that's 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 the reason for his point of view. Uh, professor, on, on a footnote, I think it's it's worth mentioning um, uh, to um, to enlighten our talk uh, by you saying that um, uh, not only kufr uh, uh, committed by the ruler uh, means that we can. Um, uh, confront them or go um, go out against them, and uh, even even fisk or uh, or not ruling. Yeah, yeah, it's very clear. It's very clear. The eye of the Quran and the hadith of of Thawban. If you could just mention this hadith and explain it for the. Al Imam Al Quraysh. Ma ida hakamu adalu, wa ida wadu wa fau, wa ida sturhimu rahimu. These are three conditions. If they fulfill that. They are worthy of being imam. If they don't do that, let's just go extreme. If they don't, don't do, if they violate all three, not only one of them, let's go to the extreme to be the, in the kosher side. They violate all that. And this is applied to all the rulers. They're violating all that. They never fulfill their promise. They are never just. 
they commit injustice definitely and and uh, and they they don't show mercy they the opposite of mercy brutality then the curse of allah and his messenger and and and, and the, uh, the angels and the, the humans will be upon them but that's not all then the prince give an instruction in that case put your sword on your shoulder and exterminate them annihilate them merciless because they are diseased they will destroy the society whatever development they make that appears to be good it ultimately that that kind of ruling would spoil and destroy the core of the society would bring it to down to this integration and will ultimately lead to kufr in the long term yeah, whatever it is it doesn't matter this is for above seven heavens that's it if you don't do that no no what they did not this is it if you do that then be serfs be harrafin ashqiya ta'kulun mikadda'idikum you will be like serfs at the time of the Prophet all the, the, the land worker uh, in most places in the world, except maybe in Arabia and Medina and so on, they were serfs under feudal lords with slaves. Then be slaves and land serfs, which which are uh, which are maintaining the ground and eating from that what they are plowing. That's all. That's all. We'll we'll end. We'll end it in in, in serfdom. That's what we'll end. It. That's that's a, that's what will be. Not necessarily in Kofun. That's enough. This situation is so miserable. That's undesirable to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Because if you accept to be a serf, meaning you accept other laws that beside Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, it's some kind of a hidden shirk. I'm not saying it's a public shirk. And those who accept to be serf are a kafir, because they are usually accepted by force, only by conditioning a child, not out of ideological acceptance. Ideological acceptance is clear cough. If you accept serfdom as a ideological, you are a kafir, no doubt. Because contradictory, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, that you have to make cover with tarot. But most people accept it just because they're born in it and it's conditioned to be halas. That's that's how the reality is. And even the the Lord here, the landlord and the king, they have divine right and so on. They are conditioned this way. You think this way you are preparing for paradise. In reality, you are preparing for misery in dunya and severe, possibly severe accounting in Akhara. And this Allah SWT forgives. You have to go deeper in this philosophy of this issue. But this brother is did not go deep. Inshallah, we're always open. We're always open for discussion. We have our Zoom classes. Yeah. Anyone and everyone can ask yeah. directly. I can. Uh, we can arrange private Zoom sessions. You can DM me. You can PM me. You can uh, tag me. I'll but but I, I believe also a great part has been tahrir because that what 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 they offer is is really highly unsatisfactory. It's slightly better than than uh, Muslim Brotherhood, which will offer amorphous things which does not bring us anywhere, and definitely much better than Madhali and Jami offer. And much better what this brother offers, which is clearly from the discussion, but they open the door for all these things. And the counterpoint view will be similar to that. And the most of people will be torn between the two points of view because most people would not have gone to the deep depth. Also, another I, mean, I see another parallel here as well with uh, with uh, Ikhwan. Ikhwan always used to talk about generalities around morality as mm -hmm. if it's not clearly defined. And then you have the example of uh, when Husni was around. Uh, Unprompted, they put an entire newspaper giving bayah to to Hasmi. I mean, yeah, what kind of yeah. message is that? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, this is clearer. This is clearer. No one, and also just to clarify, no one's saying. You know, imagine you've got a situation where you've got corruption. Ultimately, we're saying there's an entire playing field here. Yeah, yeah. you don't have to. You know, we're not in a position to start kicking off. If we use a, a colloquial phrase. Don't I think I think, I think people. Yeah, that we have to we have to do the proper education. We have to we have, obviously we have to clean the mess accumulated over fourteen hundred years, roughly. Clear, at clear. The, at yeah. the very least, see that you have an end game and recognize that these people are not to be exonerated. They don't have your back. They are your enemies. Exactly. They are the ones that Rusul has. And and and, that, and I think I think you recognize now from that what he discussed and carried after the abdication of Al Hassan and so on. We have to recognize that really. Uh, what we we are forced actually we did not do voluntarily we should have done it Eli should have done it but it was concerned about the public life is to start really with the Munafiq Kafir Muawiyah but I avoided that for a long time because I knew there would be a backlash but it is no escape you have to start with this one and show how what 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 he has done to the Ummah and this would be we also accepting and giving honor to the Hadith that the the situation of the Ummah will be straight on until it is it is broken. Uh, by, by uh, a man for Bani Umayyad. That's it. Which of these this? لا يزال أمر 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 هذا الأمم مستقيما حتى يثلمه رجل بني أمية. Is it is it the Sahihain? No, not the Sahih. Doesn't need. 
اوكي اوكي صحيح انس وير يو دونت اكسبت ذا بيور صحيح تو بوت ذات ان ذا بوكس افتر اول ذا تدريس وي هاف منشن ناو كم اون رش جيت اوت اوف ذيس مينتاليتي اوف صحيحين كم اون شيت يو يو استابليش ان اذر نيريشنز تو ا ليفل اوف سيرفس يا ذاتس ذا ايشو بوينت از ذا This is the thing, as, as is the case, as is the case with all the material, you have all the chain generation there, you can check for yourself, you can scrutinize it, you can curse us, you can do whatever, but look at it. Yeah. By yeah. all means, look at it. This is, at the end of the day, the premise is that the zikr is protected. This is the final message. Allah has revealed this message, he's protected it. The protection comes in the form of the Quran as being itself totally protected. Letter by letter, and the sunnah in, in this totality in such a way as we discussed in the book of Tawheed. So that Tawathur is definitely is a type of protection, but also single hadith can be uh, can be uh, verified and certified. But some hadith are fabricated, but they will never remain hidden and unexposed. And some hadith which have been declared to be daif and so on by by trickery of some scholars will will was later on maybe exposed to be sahih. And those scholars who claim it to be daif would be exposed as either government scholars or gullible idiots. And that's what we are doing. Part of that doing and doing it in in very extensive and detailed way. Also in in, in various in, in various satellite channels in Arabic, we are addressing various issues of this type. To But end on a very bad analogy, I always use the analogy of a boat. If you imagine the boat, you're in a boat, and you think you've got a, you have a leak, and you think you're not far from the shore, you're going to pedal like mad, and you may not reach there, or you fix the boat. And you pedal, and you'll get there eventually. Yeah. But you won't sink along the way. That's the thing. That's what it's about: cleaning and get back to fundamentals. Exactly. Oh, yeah. We may well be a very long there, way off. There's a hole. There are holes there. They they be it appear to be small, but it is sufficient to bring you down to drown. And you and you think the shore is not far away. You are mistaken. The shore is still far away. You have to plug these holes. You have to repair now, or have someone work with a bucket throwing things out, and someone cleaning the hole. Relying on that, that you can't go there or you jump and swim. If you jump and swim, the shark will eat you. That's all. That's all mistakes. That's what have been done by you, running away from the problem instead of facing it, facing it. Another thing is that did. They they recognize that hadith about bay'ah, even though by the prophet needed bay'ah and so on, is unescapable. It's just clear cover mm -hmm. to deny that the people they cannot rule. They can't rule the people without bay'ah. And that the royal inherited monarchy is acceptable. This is clear cover. Nobody argued in Islamic history about that. So what to do with these who are semi semi in semi hereditary, not publicly declared? There was semi. What to do with that? Then they have to play the trick. Uh, this actually approval of the army, approval of the business people, approval of this, and they are representing the people somehow, somehow metaphysically, like the phoenix. And they really rep never represented the interests of Ummah. I mean, all, all they represent... Independent, is... even if they represent the Sunnah, they are not representing Ummah unless they are elected. Period, full stop. Even if they represent the prayer, even if they are the best people in the universe, it doesn't fulfill the condition. But Professor, <laughs> even, if, even if they were elected, they were, uh, they, they, were, they were still continue to be representative. They are only Waqeel. Yeah, not because, not, because, not because they are business people, because they are elected. Then they will be al-aqad because of being elected, and then you do the way al 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 The Ummah is, is the owner of hal and al But executing it in a daily basis cannot be done by all people, so it is delegated by delegation. That's because it's impossible otherwise. Although in modern time now, maybe with the blockchain and so on, maybe the Ummah can participate much more than that. Even single issues can be voted upon almost daily if we can get to voting in a secure and proper way through blockchain. But this is for the future. Anyway, as, as, as time progresses, the representation can become more popular and more popular. But it, fundamentally, it has to be connected the chain to the basic with everyone eligible to vote. And nobody can exclude him from the vote except by Sharia evidence. Period. Full stop. That's it. So they constructed this imaginary phoenix called Al Halwa Al Aqd to get out of the dilemma. Okay, I think that's everything. Inshallah, let's see yeah. uh, what the response is. That's what that's happened with the scholars. Open. Even uh, if you give them the most benefit of the doubt, they were squeezed in a corner. If they're, if they're good Muslims. And some of them may have been munafiq. We don't know. But anyway, they were squeezed in a corner. Or they accepted to be squeezed in a corner. Whatever it is.
But the Ahl al-Hal al-Aqd is an imaginary construction. It does not exist. It does not substitute for bay'ah. It does not substitute for bay'ah. In Egypt, Asker is Ahl al-Hal al-Aqd. They have the power. They can smash your head. If you accept that, then might is right. And the Amr hum shura bayinam has been abrogated. And the Quran is either not from Allah or Allah is supposed to be disobeyed. There's no other alternative. Just do it this way. Because Islam is not consistent. It's not from Allah. It doesn't work this way. There's no escape. That's, that's what squeezed them to, to construct this imaginary BS called Ahl al-Hal al Okay. That's, 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 it. that's it. But this, as I, this is really a deep issue. That is, has other nations and like the English hopes and so on. The political philosophers have struggled with the problem. But you cannot blame them that they have very school of software because because they don't have a guide in Quran to refer to. Actually, they can't be blamed partly because they have they have the Old Testament in hand and so on, and they claim at least Middle Asia to believe in it, and it's clearly condemning uh, hereditary monarchy. Just read Samuel, uh, book of Samuel, uh, book one of Samuel. It's a clear condemnation of uh, monarchy. Uh, God permitted it for Israel after giving the warning that you will be oppressed and you will supplicate against your king and I will not help. It will be your own destruction. Bye. I think clearer than that, it doesn't go. And he's a sovereign. He can't permit. You want your own destruction? I permit you. Go. Destroy yourself. To the hell with you. And this dialogue between Samuel and Allah in the book is, is, is stunning. Just go and read it. So the Western people don't know, but the Western people do not refer to these books. They rely on the church to read in their behalf. But the intellectuals of, after the Enlightenment should have gone back and studied that more carefully. I'm sure that they didn't do. So they are not having full excuse. But in our scholars, they have no excuse. Because this is one protected, is uncontaminated. There is no way to say, oh, this story is actually fabricated. It's written, it's written by the people against uh, uh, who are of the Davidian party against the party of uh, someone or something. Someone could interject like that. But in the Quran, nobody can interject that. The only way to get out is to say it's not from Allah and Muhammad is not a messenger. That's the only way to get out. There's no other way. A Muslim can't get away. Anyway, I, let me just conclude when in, in Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, and then we conclude on that without very much comment. No comment, please, just Ali. When Hudayfa was, was asking the Syria about the, the, the tribulation coming after his time, because he was warning the tribulation and fit and, and the mischief will happen and so on. And he asked about Syria, so after every question in the long version of the hadith, which you don't find in Bukhari Muslim, you find it in Hibban, for example, with excellent isnad. Mr. Allah did not answer him what will happen. Say, Hudayfa, ta'allam kitab Allah wa amal bima fiyh. Hudayfa, study the book of Allah. Again, ilm, ta'allam, not study, not read. Ta'allam kitab Allah. Again, knowledge from the book of Allah and ba'amal bima fiyh, and act upon it. And then he asked him, okay, I will do, but uh, tell me what will the, the next fitna. And he repeats three times. Then he mentioned one fitna. Then he said, there's after that another fitna. Say, Hudayfa, ta'allam kitab Allah wa amal bima fiyh. Repeat again and again. So I tell everyone, do that. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to Hudayfa. Ta'allam kitab Allah wa'amal bima fi. It will be sufficient. You wouldn't need anything further. Especially in this issue, you wouldn't even need that. You don't need the hadith of Thawban, Umhani, and Umhani of Bashir and Al-Sumbad. It's enough the ayah. La tut'inu ata al kafura. With enough ayah. It's enough for, for me for everyone. Ta'allamu kitab Allah wa'amalu bima fi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.